Seth stared at Lacey out of the corner of his eye, keeping his face pointed at the movie screen. He didn't want to get caught looking at her, didn't want to freak her out. He still couldn't believe he'd convinced her to go out with him, and he didn't want to make her regret it already. He couldn't believe he'd pulled this off at all and wondered if God wasn't supporting his efforts somehow. Maybe not, though, as God probably wouldn't go against parents, and his parents definitely did not support this. Their rule was no dating till senior year. He was a sophomore. If it weren't for his older brother Chase, Seth wouldn't have pulled it off, but Chase had given him a ride and hadn't tattled. He also hadn't told their other brother Burke, which was helpful, because Burke would definitely have tattled. But Seth felt ready to date. He felt ready to get married as long as he was marrying Lacey Flint. Of course, he wasn't going to tell her that. She glanced at him and smiled, and he quickly looked away. Her hand rested on her knee, open, palm up. He had never wanted anything as much as he wanted to grab that beautiful hand. But he didn't quite dare. And he didn't want her to think that he'd only asked her to the movies because he was trying to get physical with her. That wasn't why he had asked her. He'd asked her because he couldn't stand not asking her for one day longer, and because he was scared that if he didn't get moving, someone else was going to ask her first. He'd seen how the seniors looked at her, heard what they said about her in the locker room. Every day that went by, Lacey Flint got more beautiful. She had a sort of hypnotic effect on him, and he knew she wasn't doing it on purpose, which made the hypnosis all the more powerful. She looked at him again and then, quick as a cat, she reached over and grabbed his hand. His heart jumped into his throat. So she hadn't just accepted his invitation because she was nice or because she pitied him. Maybe she actually liked him. If so, then God was definitely on his side. He squeezed her hand and caressed it with his thumb. She shifted in her chair, scooting closer to him as her left hand pulled his hand into her lap and then transferred it to her right hand, before looping her left arm around his elbow. Then she hugged his arm and nuzzled in. He thought he might die from joy. He was going to marry this girl. Chapter 1 Please be discreet, Lacey said under her breath. You've said that ten times already, Stevie said. Had she? She didn't think she'd said it at all, but she was so nervous that she couldn't think straight. And if you wanted to be discreet, you probably shouldn't have dressed to outshine the bride. Thank you. She said it as a reflex. It wasn't a compliment. You look ridiculous. She would have given him a dirty look, but she didn't want to draw attention to them. Which is it? Am I shiny or ridiculous? He didn't answer her, and this was okay. An usher met them as soon as they stepped into the barn. He smiled broadly, and she looked at him carefully. It had been years since she had seen any of the Honeywood brothers, but she was pretty sure this wasn't one of them. Bride or groom, he asked. Bride, Stevie said at the same time as Lacey said a groom. Lacey wanted to smack him. She'd given him one instruction, don't talk to anyone. She smiled brightly. We know them both. The usher did not look suspicious. He simply turned and motioned toward the rows of chairs. Take your pick, then. They went to the far back corner and sat, and Lacey immediately busied herself with her phone. She let her long blonde hair hang down over her face, trying to be invisible. Stevie managed to stay quiet for a few minutes, but then he gave up the fight. Why did I let you talk me into this? Because you wanted free food, she said without looking up. I'm not sure it's worth it. Little late for that now. Fine. I won't ever make you do this again. She had already decided that much. Why didn't you bring a real date? It wouldn't be very nice of me to bring a real date to stock an old date, now would it? Aha, uh -huh, he cried with more triumph than he'd earned. I told you that you were stalking Seth, and you denied it. Stevie wasn't the only one regretting her decision to bring him. Please. I have never asked you for anything. Fine. But you owe me one. Obviously. She was going to be paying for this stupidity for the rest of her life. To be fair, she hadn't really thought this plan through. It had all happened so fast. 
She had found out about the Honeywood's new venture, which seemed so random that she thought she was being punked. But then she'd gotten so excited at having an organic reason to bump into Seth that she had lost all sense. She sighed. Now that she was here, this didn't feel very organic. And Stevie was right, she was overdressed. Looking around at all the blue jeans and sandals, she wished she hadn't put on a cocktail dress. She had wanted to look good, had wanted to knock his socks off, but she'd forgotten about blending in. She felt someone stop beside her chair, and she held her breath. Steve, a male voice said. She froze. I didn't know you knew Dwight. It took Lacey a few seconds to remember that Dwight was the groom that neither she nor Stevie knew at all. Oh, yeah, Stevie said. We go way back. His voice quivered. He was a terrible liar. And who is this? The voice went smarmy. She wanted to give him a dirty look, but she didn't look up for fear of being recognized. This is my cousin, Lacey Flint. The dude laughed, and Lacey finally looked up so she could glare at him. She hadn't meant to, but self control had never been one of her strengths. He stopped laughing abruptly, but he still said, Who brings a cousin to a wedding? A man who can't find a date, Stevie said. Well, let's hope you meet someone at the reception, hopefully, someone you're not related to. The man lurched off. Who was that guy? Lacey mumbled. Don't remember his name. I used to work with him. We're still staying for the reception, right? I'm hungry. She hadn't decided yet. Let's see if we can get through the wedding first. There was still a chance they'd get caught and then thrown out. She didn't see any bouncers, but Chase Honeywood had never liked her. If he spotted her, she was as good as gone. She scanned the barn for any sign of Seth but didn't see him. Was it possible that he wasn't going to be here? What a fool that would make her. Of course, she was now officially a wedding crasher, so she was a fool either way. Stevie read her mind. Do you see him? Nope, she admitted. Who told you he was going to be here? No one. Stevie looked at her sharply. What? Then why are we here? I figured that if someone knew the Honeywoods well enough to rent out their barn, then Seth would know them well enough to attend the wedding. Stevie gave her a withering look. That's the most illogical thing I've ever heard you say. She rolled her shoulders back, trying to think of words to defend herself, but she didn't really understand his accusation. Sure, this plan was a little aggressive, but how was it illogical? This is like a real venue. This is what Hudson does to make money now. It's a legit business. They don't know the people who rent their barn. Someone rents it every weekend. Her stomach sank. What? Why is it such a big deal? It's only a barn in the middle of nowhere. He shrugged. A barn that is rentable. I guess that makes it a little rarer. And I've heard good things about the caterer. Of course he had. So Seth really might not show up. I bet the farm Seth doesn't even know these people. I thought you knew that he was going to be here. I thought so too. The music started, and she turned to watch bridesmaids she didn't know walk down the aisle in bright lime green taffeta gowns. Chapter 2 Seth Honeywood walked into the horse barn and paused to let his eyes adjust to the lighting. Then he looked around for his brother. Hearing a noise in the tack room, he turned that way. Yeah. Chase said when Seth knocked. Seth opened the door and walked in. You don't have to knock. Don't I, though? This is your house. It wasn't, really. Chase shared a real house with Hudson, but Seth was pretty sure that the extreme introvert spent all his time out here now. Might have to find a new one, Chase grumbled. Seth didn't need him to elaborate. He hadn't been on the ranch when it all went down, but he'd heard. Olivia had been up in arms about it. The wedding guests had asked the ranch to supply horseback rides as part of the reception. The bride and her family were from away, apparently somewhere where there were no horses. Neptune, maybe. Or Massachusetts. Wherever they'd come from, Hudson had made promises, without consulting Chase first. 
They were Chase's horses. Chase had not been happy. He had tried to stop it. But Hudson, Evelyn, and Olivia made a formidable team, and Chase had lost the battle, despite the fact that it seemed the Basset Hound was on his side. Even now, the pup was curled up at Chase's feet, eyeing Seth warily. I like what you've done with the place. Seth tried to keep his tone light. He didn't feel it was his responsibility to cheer Chase up, Chase had every right to be grumpy, but it was awkward sitting there in angry silence. I don't need help. This surprised Seth a little, and stung a little more. I know, he said quickly, but I know you want nothing to do with this, so I thought maybe I could minimize your contact with the guests. He'd already seen the bridal party. Seth wasn't one to judge, but so far they seemed to be the type of people that would make Chase say things most people would regret. And they'd been drinking champagne while getting their hair done. That couldn't be good. Chase looked up at him. Did Hudson put you up to this? Seth shook his head. Nope. Chase narrowed his eyes. Come on, man. I wouldn't lie about it. Good grief. Chase was in even worse form than usual. Chase sighed and tipped his head back. Sorry, man. I'm in a bad place. I know. That's why I wanted to be here. And really, where else would he be on a Saturday? He had the most boring life in the world. Seth's eyes fell on the hound, who now had both eyes closed. What's with Lewis? What's he doing here? Hiding. Just like me. Seth didn't know what to say. He felt bad for Chase. Hudson and he had bought this small ranch as a haven for Chase, and it had become anything but. Seth hadn't discussed it with anyone, but he thought that if Chase could afford a place with enough space for horses, he would already be long gone. Someone knocked on the door, and Chase groaned. Seth turned to see Burke sticking his head in. Oh hey, he said when he saw Seth. Didn't know you were here. He came in and took the only remaining empty chair. Thought Chase might need a hand. Chase looked at Burke and then looked at Seth. I'm not sure whether to feel loved or claustrophobic. Burke shrugged. Feel both. His face still bore scars from his recent bull riding accident, but he was looking better every time Seth saw him. Are you hiding too? Seth asked. Burke shook his head. Nah, they don't go below ground. He and his wife had been living in Hudson and Chase's basement while Burke recuperated. I truly thought I might be able to help. Can't do much, but thought maybe I could help with crowd control. Chase's face twisted in pain at the words. I don't understand, Seth admitted. You don't have nearly enough horses for all these people. How is this going to work? Olivia said they're going to take turns, and not everyone will want to ride, Burke said. Only two horses, Chase mumbled. Chase had more than two horses, so Seth took this to mean that he only had two horses that would be safe to let strangers, possibly strangers who didn't know how to ride, get on the back of. Have you got a third horse I can ride? Seth said. I could go with them, babysit. Chase chewed on that for a minute before nodding. He didn't say anything, but Seth could see the gratitude on his face. Okay, then. I'll go for some short rides, make sure they don't do anything stupid. He looked out the window, and though he couldn't see any of the guests from there, he said, Sure seems like there's more people here than there was supposed to be. Chapter 3 Lacey's whole body was full of pins and needles. She'd never been so paranoid. While she desperately reminded herself that no one in this barn was paying any attention to her, she could still feel prying eyes. She was going to get caught. She was a wedding crasher, a stalker, a complete airheaded loser, and she was going to get caught. So she was quite thrilled when the service ended swiftly. Good grief. Stevie ran a hand under his collar. It's hotter than Haiti in here. The word is Hades. Her eyes were too busy searching for an escape route, or she would have rolled them. Despite multiple air conditioners chugging away, the barn was sweltering. But this was a good thing. Stevie was uncomfortable, so he'd be willing to leave. But then he said, thank the heavens they're having the reception outside, and her stomach rolled. 
If he was thanking the heavens, then he still cared about the reception. It was true that she'd promised him free food, but things had changed now. Seth wasn't here. These people weren't locals. She was going to get caught. Come on, she muttered. I'll buy you food on the way home. She edged out into the aisle. He laughed. What? I don't want a greasy hamburger in a sack when I can have fancy food. Fine, I'll buy you fancy food. She walked faster, wobbling a little on her high heels. She normally wasn't the high heel wearing type, but she'd wanted to look slim. Where had he cried too loudly, and she kept walking, considering that maybe she should make her getaway without him. There is no fancy food in West Hope, he called after her. She was moving so fast that his voice faded with each step. She spilled out into the sunlight, and the current of people nearly swept her off toward the giant reception tent, but she broke away and headed toward the cars. She was just about home free when she heard a terrible squeal that she knew couldn't possibly have anything to do with her. When something large and heavy slammed into her back, she figured it was either Stevie or a stray buffalo, but then she smelled the musky citrus perfume. Buffaloes don't wear Dolly Parton front porch collection, she thought as she tried to wheel around to face her attacker. But one of her high heels got stuck in the ground, and she toppled over backward, her skirt flew up, and she used her hands to press it back down instead of breaking her fall. Just before she landed in the tall grass, she caught a glimpse of Stevie, through the sea of lime green taffeta, he was running toward her with his arms outstretched. How nice. He was trying to be a hero. Landing did nothing to assuage her panic as suddenly she couldn't breathe. Her face was smothered in crispy fake fabric. She batted at it to try to get it off her, and then the woman wearing the awful thing finally did a push-up and smiled down at her, her necklace dangling in Lacey's face. It was far too intimate an arrangement, and Lacey rolled sideways to get out of it, but she smacked into the woman's arm, which caused the woman to fall again. She briefly crushed Lacey's right hip, but then let out a happy cackle as she rolled off into the grass. Only when Lacey scrambled to her feet did she realize she'd injured an ankle in this madness and had lost the stuck shoe. It had been an expensive shoe, and she'd certainly earned it, but she didn't care about the shoe. She didn't even care why a six-foot-tall bridesmaid had tackled her in a field. She just wanted to get out of there. But the crazy woman reached out and grabbed her ankle. Tonia, the woman cried with glee. What? Who was Tonia? The woman's hands climbed Lacey's leg as she pulled herself to a seated position. Mortified, Lacey slapped her hand away, catching Stevie's eye, who stood there looking mortified and helpless. And he wasn't alone. To Lacey's horror, a crowd had formed to watch this mayhem. Tonia, the woman cried again, throwing a meaty arm around Lacey's shoulder. Lacey looked up into the face of this complete stranger who towered over her. So sorry, didn't mean to make you fall down. She slurred her words together. I'm a little tippy. She'd likely meant tipsy, but tippy worked, and she was a few drinks beyond tipsy. A little closer to schnockered. She started to pull Lacey toward the tent. Come on, let's go get a drink and catch up. Lacey staggered several steps before allowing herself to lose the second shoe. She was desperate to pull away, but there were more than a dozen people watching. And this woman had such a grip on her. It would make more of a scene to resist than to comply. She just really hoped the real Tonia wasn't here somewhere because that was going to be embarrassing. Shortly after Lacey and her new friend reached the tent, the looky loose lost interest. They were probably more excited about the food. Goliath dragged her to the punch table, and Stevie trailed behind. The woman poured two glasses of the bright red beverage, explaining, Sadie wanted a dry wedding, but Ariel fixed that problem right quick. She blinked both eyes dramatically, and it took Lacey a second to realize she'd tried to wink. Goliath offered her one of the plastic glasses. Lacey shook her head. No, thank you. No, she cried too loudly. Why not? A few heads turned but only briefly. I don't drink. The woman cackled. Me neither, she screeched and then tipped her head back to laugh before faking a sober expression to say, but I really hate weddings. Then why are you a bridesmaid? Lacey said before she could stop herself. 
You need to get out of here, not try to reason with this person. We all make mistakes, she said as if this explained everything and then drained her drink. She looked at the food table. I really need to get some food in my stomach. No kidding. She looked at Lacey. And then we'll dance. Just like we did at Mosher's. She cackled. Boy did I drink too much when we went to Mosher's. Lacey pressed her lips into a thin line. She wasn't much of a dancer and wasn't confident that she could do whatever Tonia had done at Mosher's. Come on, let's sit down. She dragged Lacey toward the head table, and Lacey let out a little shriek and dug her bare toes into the fake grass carpet. I can't go to the head table. What? Why not? The woman narrowed her eyes. Hey, why weren't you supposed to be a bridesmaid? Oh no. Here it comes. Chapter 4 Seth watched Burke closely as he helped saddle the three horses. Burke moved slowly and carefully, and Seth was starting to relax when Burke winced. Do you want a break? Seth asked. He didn't want to offend him, but he wanted to be helpful. Burke shook his head. No, I'm good. He looked embarrassed. How are the memories? Seth knew they were coming back and wanted to shift Burke's focus to something positive. It's hard to know because I don't know how much I can't remember. He chuckled dryly. But new stuff comes back nearly every day. Ava's happy with my progress, which is all I care about. As long as I remember her, I'm happy. That was good to hear, though a small bit of jealousy tried to snake its way into Seth's heart at Burke's use of the word happy. Burke had been lucky to get married early, but the rest of the Honeywood brothers sure hadn't. The rest of them had been unlucky in love for years. But that had been changing lately. First Wyatt had met Olivia, and then Hudson had found Evelyn. And it seemed that against all odds, Dustin was destined to marry a bona fide country music star. What was next, Chase was going to turn into a Romeo. Seth chuckled at the thought. What's so funny? Burke sounded defensive. Seth would never laugh at him now, but Burke had a right to be paranoid. Seth had laughed at him plenty of times. Just this whole thing, Seth said. It's so ridiculous. The wedding chapel out front or the horseback riding in back? Seth laughed again. Both, but I meant the chapel barn. I mean, where did that even come from? It's preposterous. I don't remember it happening, but I hear it came from Olivia. Bet she's regretting that now. From everything he'd seen, she was losing her mind from the stress. Maybe. Burke looked thoughtful. I heard her say something like she didn't expect it to be this busy, ever, let alone this fast. Well, they did have Mindy Rose advertising for them. That sort of sped up the timeline. Yeah, I suppose it did. Uh-oh. Here they come. Seth looked up to see a small group of people heading across the property. Already? Have they even cut the cake yet? Maybe they're gluten intolerant. Seth snickered. There's a gluten-free cake, Chase said from the shadows. Burke looked bewildered. Are you serious? He didn't answer, but Chase didn't joke often, so Seth assumed there really was a gluten-free cake. Good grief, Olivia thinks of everything. Everything but her own mental health, Chase muttered. So then Seth wasn't the only one who'd noticed. Should I be doing something right now? Chase stared out the barn doorway toward the oncoming foot traffic. One of them was wearing an exceptionally tight dress. Seth hoped she wasn't going to try to ride in it. Seth looked at Burke. I'll ride with them. Can you stay here and explain to people that they're supposed to wait? Burke didn't look excited, but he nodded. Then he looked around. For what, Seth didn't know, but seconds later Chase came out of the barn with a folded chair that he set up behind Burke. Burke thanked him and Saturday, okay. He sighed deeply. I'm ready. Chase looked at Seth, who nodded and said, I got this. He looked at the guests. Not sure what I'm going to do with the one in the orange dress, but I'll figure it out. When Chase didn't respond, Seth looked in his direction, but he was already gone. Seth sighed. 
I hate it when he does that, Burke said. Seth chuckled. How long did he say these rides are supposed to be? Fifteen minutes or so. Less if they annoy you. More if one of them is pretty. Seth laughed. He was pretty confident that his type of woman wouldn't be at this particular wedding. These people weren't his people. Hi, folks, Seth said when they got close. There were five of them. We're only riding two horses today, so two of you can go first. The man in the group gave him a withering look. I count three horses. Seth tried to maintain his smile. This one's mine. Why are you coming? Ranch rules, he said, and Burke hit a smirk. The man was obviously annoyed but didn't argue. He looked at Miss Orange Dress. Let's you and me go first. She nodded excitedly. Seth suppressed a groan. I'm afraid you won't be able to ride in that dress, ma'am. Her eyes widened in offense. And just why not? Seriously? He considered his words carefully. You'll need to be able to straddle the saddle. She pursed her lips and folded her arms in front of her, but she didn't say anything, and Seth was grateful he'd won what he'd expected would be a bigger battle. Can't she ride sideways, the man said. I've seen that before. Seth was so glad Chase wasn't there and hoped he couldn't hear from inside the tack room. No one really rides sideways, and if she wants to ride side saddle, she would need a different saddle. Why, the man asked, looking at the saddle. She could sit sideways in that one. Seth stared at him, speechless. She can ride with me then, and I'll hold on to her. It's one rider per horse. This was going to be a long day. Why? He was part inquisitive toddler, part aged out frat boy. Ranch rules, Seth said. There are a lot of ranch rules, Burke said, his face deadpan. Toddler frat boy winced at Burke's words, which made Seth feel bad about himself. The man was intimidated by a man in a folding lawn chair? He'd been ready to walk all over Seth. Seth straightened his shoulders. Maybe someone else should go first. Do you have some pants I can borrow? Miss Orange Dress asked. Burke snickered too loudly. We don't, Seth said. Fine. I'll just pull my dress up. She stepped toward the horse. She was going to what? She looked at Seth and pointed at a horse. This one? Ma'am, you might not be comfortable riding without any, he didn't know how to finish that sentence. It's a short ride, Burke said. Seth didn't know if he was trying to imply that she wouldn't have time for chafing or if he was telling Seth to get this over with and give them a three-minute ride around the barn. An image of toddler frat boy on a pony ride circle flashed through his mind, and he almost laughed. Fine then, he said, mostly to cover his laugh. Grab the saddle horn, and then put your left foot in the stirrup. He got closer so that he could help, but he tried not to look at her. He didn't know when she planned to hike her skirt or what she was wearing underneath. Oh my word, Misty, one of the other women squealed. You didn't have to pull it up that far. Seth glanced at Burke, who was also averting his eyes. Are you good? Seth asked Miss Orange Dress. Yes. She giggled with excitement. He stepped back and took a quick glance to make sure she was in fact in the saddle. He handed her the reins. Hold on to these, but you won't need to do much with them. I'm going to go first, and your horse will follow mine. His chest swelled with distrust. He looked her in the eye. Don't yank the reins in any direction, or you could get hurt, okay? This was stupid. Had Hudson had these people sign any waivers? And maybe the ranch should be making them wear helmets. He wanted to strangle Olivia and Hudson. Okay. Now she sounded nervous. She looked back at toddler frat boy, who had mounted his own horse. Is this safe? Of course it is. People do it all the time. Seth and Burke exchanged a look. Good luck, Burke said dryly. Chapter 5 Having successfully convinced one giant bridesmaid that the bride had never asked Tonia to be a bridesmaid and that Tonia's ankles, 
hurt too much to dance, Lacey learned that the drunken bridesmaid's name was Kelly. And Kelly was mad that she was at this wedding. She acted as though Lacey, or Tonia, at least, should already know why she was so angry. She'd eaten a lot of food and had sobered up a bit, but she was still very inebriated. Let's go ride a horse. Lacey's eyes burned as buried memories sprang to the surface. She hadn't ridden a horse in ages, not since she'd ridden with Seth. He had never owned horses, but they'd had friends who did, and they'd gone for long, leisurely, romantic rides together. The memories hurt her head. Kelly was staring at her, waiting for an answer. No thanks. I'm not really a horse person. She let out a shrill laugh. Obviously. Neither am I. But how often are we in, it seemed she'd forgotten where she was, but then she stretched both arms out. The Wild West. When's the next time you're going to be anywhere near a horse? Well, since Lacey had just moved back to South Dakota, probably quite a bit. But you're not Lacey. You're Tonia. I think maybe it's time for me to go home. I don't feel so good. She looked around for Stevie, but there was no sign of him. You can't be serious. Are you flying out tonight? It was a tricky question, and she didn't have the answer for it. Do you have a hotel, she persisted? Another tricky question. If she said she had a room, Kelly might ask to sleep in it. Because you can crash here with me. I'm sharing a room with Ariel, but I'm sure she won't mind. I know they don't have enough rooms here for everybody. She shuddered. I can't believe they picked this place, but Sadie thought it was oh so romantic. She rolled her eyes as she talked. Wait, you and Ariel patched things up, right? Her eyes widened with the imagined drama. She was practically salivating. Oh, yeah, she tried to sound confident, making a mental note to avoid Ariel. Maybe that was why the real Tonia wasn't at the wedding. Hey, look. There's Ariel. She waved to a smaller version of the lime green dress, who was fast approaching. To the horses. Lacey cried, springing up from her chair. She didn't wait for Kelly to join her and thought maybe Kelly would forget to do so. She'd gone a hundred feet before that small hope was dashed. Hey, wait up. Kelly's huffing and puffing grew louder. Lacey would have sped up, but her bare feet were starting to hurt. It had been one thing to walk around on astroturf, it was another thing entirely to be cutting across a hay field. Kelly caught up to her, and Lacey slowed down. She went another hundred feet before stopping. Her feet were really starting to hurt. This was insane. How had she gotten herself into such a mess? She turned and looked back at the tent, which was only slightly closer to her now than the horse barn was. But the tent had Ariel in it. Lacey looked toward the front yard, which was sort of a parking lot. That was closer, but it would still be quite a haul on bare feet. And there was gravel. She looked down at her toes. How she wished she'd never cursed the high heels. What's wrong? Kelly's eyes followed hers, and she let out a dainty gasp that did not match her persona. Her hands flew to her mouth. Oh no. Your tootsies. And then before Lacey could stop it, Kelly swept her up into her arms like a proud groom about to carry a bride over the threshold. Lacey wiggled. No, no, put me down. Nonsense. Kelly started walking, breathing hard. Your tootsies are bleeding. Lacey was mortified, but she also didn't have many options, and her feet were gleeful with relief. So she dangled there, bouncing in the bridesmaid's arms, watching the barn get closer and closer. Oh no. That was Burke Honeywood. A small line had formed outside the barn, and he sat at the front of it, staring down at his phone. Lacey's chest grew tight with panic. What was she supposed to do now? Ask Kelly to carry her to her car? The one that still had Illinois plates? What were the chances Tonia was from Illinois? She could say it was a rental, but the laundry baskets and boxes jammed in the back seat would suggest that was a lie. Wait. His injury. He'd lost his memory, right? So maybe he wouldn't remember her. Yeah, maybe it would be okay. 
she was desperate to convince herself. And maybe he wouldn't even look up from his phone. He seemed pretty intent on ignoring the people in line. Lacey noticed three women standing off to the side and realized she had a new problem. Everyone in the long horse riding line was wearing pants. The three women in dresses had their own line, and Lacey was guessing it was a line for waiting only. Uh, Kelly? She grunted. I'm not sure you're going to be able to ride a horse in your dress. Kelly gave her a dirty look, and a bead of sweat dripped off her eyebrow. For the first time, Lacey felt really bad for Kelly. The woman was drunk and maybe even insane, but she was growing on her. You really don't have to carry me. I'll be okay. We're almost there, and you're wearing a dress too. True, but Lacey's was loose and flowing, and she could easily tuck the fabric around her legs. Her bare feet were a much bigger problem than her dress. Right, so we'll tell them that neither of us can ride. Kelly stopped walking, obviously horrified at the idea of having to turn around. She was committed to protecting Tonia's feet, but she'd underestimated the stamina such an endeavor would take. An idea occurred to Lacey, and it was so obvious that she was deeply embarrassed she hadn't thought of it. She patted Kelly's shoulder. Put me down for real. I have an idea. Her feet screamed in agony the second they touched the sharp grass, but Lacey tried to hide the pain. You don't need to carry me. Can you just go borrow a pair of boots for me? From someone, anyone, in the tent. I'll give them right back when I get there. Kelly acted as if that was brilliant. Sure. She took off back toward the tent. Lacey looked down to scan for snakes, decided there might not be any, and then plopped down in the grass. Now mostly hidden, she watched Kelly go. She glanced at the house that stood between her and her car and tried to judge the distance. Maybe she could crawl in that direction. But there was a giant moat area behind the house. If Kelly caught her crawling across the lawn, she would have some explaining to do. Could she crawl that far before Kelly got back? She had to try. She got onto her hands and knees and started moving, keeping her eyes on the ground for any sign of slithering. She wasn't afraid of snakes, but she was afraid of venom. The grass didn't hurt her hands, but her knees weren't doing as well. Still, her feet were getting a break. Might as well spread the damage around better than concentrating it in one spot. She reached the lawn and stopped to peek out of the tall grass, looking for any sign of Kelly, or worse, a honeywood, and that's when she heard it. The whine of an ATV. It might have been easy to assume that this unexpected sound had nothing to do with her, but she'd made that mistake before, when she'd heard Kelly's initial scream of recognition. And so now, even though she couldn't imagine how her life was about to be further complicated by a four-wheeler, she knew that it was coming for her. Chapter 6 Seth's third horseback ride was with two people who weren't obnoxious. When he reached the point in their route where it was time to turn back, he considered not doing so. Maybe he should put his head down and keep heading west, like the old days. Go west, young man, a faint yet persuasive voice coaxed but Seth couldn't abandon Burke, so he turned around. The guests looked as disappointed as he felt. He nearly groaned when he saw how much the line outside the barn had grown. The good news was, it now appeared that word had spread that dresses weren't a good idea. It had taken Miss Orange Dress a fat minute to dismount, and though she tried to hide her discomfort, she had failed. But now the line was full of a different problem, children. As Seth rode nearer, the terror on Burke's face became clearer. Trying to appear calm and in control, Seth swiftly dismounted. Burke turned to face him. He'd actually lost color in his face. With difficulty he got out of his chair and approached. I like kids, a man, but these, these aren't normal children. Seth glanced past Burke at the mob of short humans. They ran through the grass slapping and pushing each other. It appeared they'd suck down a few red bulls each. What are they doing? Burke turned to look at them as well. They say they're playing hide and seek, but it seems to be the Hunger Games edition. Yeah, I don't remember hide and seek being that violent. Seth glanced at the line of adults. And their parents are in that line somewhere? I don't know. I think they must be. 
Seth realized that his most recent customers had dismounted and were trying to thank them. He smiled and tipped his hat to them and then looked at the next people in line. You can't go again, Burke said. Not till we fix this. Someone's going to get hurt. As Burke talked, a stubby boy knocked a boy twice his height into the manure pile. Ah, the larger kid sat up crying. You knocked me into a pile of poop. He held his hands up in front of his face and stared at them in horror. That's not poop, the little boy yelled into his face. Those are apples. He cackled and then ran away. We have to do something, Burke said. I know. But what? After a moment of fruitless thought, Seth approached the closest kid, a boy of about eight. Hiya. He tried to sound friendly. The boy scowled, but Seth hardly noticed. He was far more alarmed by the tiny girl about six feet behind him. She couldn't have been three years old yet, but she faced him, widened her stance, curled her tiny hands into fists, and then growled at him. Not a cute little toddler grunt either. A bona fide growl. He looked back at Burke to see if he'd heard it, but Burke was worriedly watching the boy still sitting on the edge of the manure pile. Seth made himself smile at the little girl. Is your mama here, sweetie? She growled again. It was so exaggerated that he thought she must be playing. Surely a child this young, this cute, could not be this aggressive? Seth looked at the boy. Is this your little sister? No, the boy cried and then turned and disappeared into the grass like a sprite in a cornfield. Fine, then. If he couldn't communicate with the children, he was going to have to do so with the adults. He headed for that line. Hi, folks. I'm assuming these kids belong to some of you? A woman in a white jumpsuit waved his concern away. They're okay. They're just playing. Good. He resisted the urge to look at Burke. Playing is good. We just need them to be supervised so they won't get hurt, Anne. The man beside the woman snorted. You're the guy who makes your kid wear a bike helmet, aren't you? Seth's jaw tightened. It wasn't easy to get him riled up, but calling attention to the fact that he didn't have a family yet was one of the few ways to do it. No, sir. But they're hitting and kicking each other. Boys will be boys, the man said dismissively. In the background, Seth could still hear the little girl growling. He didn't know how to proceed, and he couldn't wait to give Hudson and Olivia a piece of his mind. When he heard Hudson's four-wheeler fire up in the distance, he thought maybe he'd get the chance soon. He looked at the next two people in line. They appeared to be a couple. Are your children here? Yeah, the man said tentatively. Seth tried to stand tall when he said, then I'm afraid you can't ride until they're back under the tent. The man's face grew red, but the woman quickly doused the flames with, I'll go back, honey. I wasn't that excited about this anyway. She smiled at Seth. No offense. None taken, ma'am. He couldn't imagine why any of these people were excited about a 15-minute horseback ride, especially when there was good music and even better food just a short walk away. I don't want to go ride with some stranger. He angrily shook off her hand and turned to storm off. Come on, kids. He waved over his shoulder. None of the kids moved. The woman gave Seth an apologetic smile and then went to gather her ducklings. Seth was amused to see that the angry toddler was one of them. Evelyn came around the corner of the ranch house and headed his way. He waited for her to get there before doing anything else. She looked at him, then at Burke, and then back to him. Chase texted me. She faced the line. I'll be happy to watch the kids. She pointed to an open area near the front of the barn. I'll make sure everyone stays safe. But please do tell them to stop hitting and kicking. We don't want anyone to get hurt. The whine of the four-wheeler got louder, and Seth turned to face it. He squinted, trying to understand what he was seeing. That didn't look like Hudson. Chapter 7 the whining grew louder, and because Lacey didn't want to get run over, she stood and turned to face the music. There she was, Kelly. In all her lime green glory, straddling a four-wheeler, a wide, proud grin on her round face. 
It was absurd, incredibly frustrating, and yet amusing. You have to get out of here. You're starting to actually like Kelly. Kelly waited till she was directly beside her before slamming on the brakes, throwing herself into whiplash. Whoa, there, she said dramatically. Almost went right over the handlebars. She slurred the word handlebars, so it sounded like an exotic tropical vacation destination. She reached around to pat the seat behind her, missed, and slapped the side of the machine. Hop on. Let's get you on that horse. For a second, Lacey thought she was confusing the ATV with a horse, but then she understood. Take the ATV to the horse. Despite her understanding, she hesitated. This couldn't be a good idea, but she didn't have another one. She didn't want to cause a scene, and her feet were killing her. It was self-destructive to get on a motorized machine with this woman, especially when she was in control of the throttle, but maybe Lacey deserved to self-destruct. She'd crashed a wedding. She just needed to get out of here. She had an idea. You know what? My feet really hurt. They did hurt, but she exaggerated for dramatic effect. Can you just give me a ride to my car? And then I promise we can go horseback riding sometime soon. Kelly's brow furrowed, and slowly, her smile slid off her face. Uh-oh. How are we going to go for a horseback ride? Lacey had no idea, and she didn't dare to guess. You live in Minnesota. I live in Massachusetts. Right, Lacey said slowly. Heat radiated off the machine, making her legs sweat. She would have taken a step back, but that would have hurt a lot too, so she opted to let her knee skin melt. Kelly was waiting for a better answer. I'll come visit you. Lacey tried to make it sound like a promise, not a guess. She wasn't sure if she'd succeeded. Kelly narrowed her eyes and stared. Who are you, she said slowly, suddenly sounding startlingly sober. Huh? Lacey tried to play dumb. You're not Tonia. Oh boy. The ruse was up. Time to confess. Lacey opened her mouth to beg for mercy, but Kelly cut her off. People don't change that much. You're never going to come visit me. You hate Massachusetts, remember? Lacey had never been there, but she tried to look agreeable. Get on, let's go ride the horse, and then I'll give you a lift to your car. Lacey glanced toward the barn. Burke still sat out front, and now another man stood nearby him. He had his back toward her, so she couldn't guess whether it was another Honeywood, but she hoped not. He looked too thick to be Seth, thank goodness, and she desperately hoped it wasn't Chase. She didn't think Chase would recognize her, but she wasn't positive. She looked at Kelly. You promise? She nodded stoutly. Girl Scout pledge. She snorted with laughter. Just kidding. I was never in the Girl Scouts. But yes, I will drive you to your car. Lacey wasn't confident that the Honeywoods would continue to allow Kelly to borrow the four-wheeler, but this was the closest she'd come to escaping this nightmare, so she climbed onto the machine. Kelly reached back, grabbed her hand, and brought it around her ample waist. Hang on. Lacey didn't really want to be snuggled up to this woman's sweaty back, but her fear of death trumped her inhibitions, so she fisted a handful of taffeta and squeezed her eyes shut. Here we go. Giddy up. The machine lurched forward, and Lacey would have slid right off the back of it if not for the taffeta lifeline. She held her breath and waited for death to come as Kelly cackled into the wind. The machine bounced across the field, and Lacey held on for dear life. Why aren't we there yet? She opened her eyes and peeked over Kelly's shoulder to see the barn right in front of them. Why wasn't she slowing down? And then, even closer, a child popped up out of the grass like a deranged jack-in-the-box, look out. Lacey screamed. Kelly screamed with her and yanked the machine to the left. Lacey had a second to be grateful that they were heading away from the barn before panic clutched her as the machine slammed into something else. The front of the four-wheeler pitched down, taking Kelly with it, and Lacey was thrown off the back, bottom first. She tried to hold on, but the slippery taffeta slid out of her hands. For a split second, she was airborne, and then, thud. Chapter 8 
Seth's heart recognized the woman who was flying through the air toward the manure pile before his brain did. Pain stabbed at his chest even as a sweet warmth filled him from hat to boot. When he realized what he was looking at, he became quite annoyed with that warmth. No. It couldn't be. First of all, she was here. In West Hope. But no, she wasn't really. She was at a wedding. So she was probably just here for the wedding. But it was hard to believe that she knew these people. And she didn't quite look like Lacey. Of course, it had been a while. Maybe you're wrong. She texted you a while ago, she's been on your mind, and now you're hallucinating. The woman flying through the air was wearing a dress, it couldn't be Lacey. Sure, she'd worn one for prom, but then she'd complained about it all night. Whoever she was, she was still lying in the manure. Burke hurried past him to assist, giving him a bewildered look on the way by that said, what is wrong with you? Seth knew he should go make sure she was okay. No matter what she was doing here, and no matter why she'd chosen to drive Hudson's four-wheeler into a hill of poop at 40 miles per hour, it still wasn't Burke's problem. But Seth couldn't quite make his boots move. Is that? Seth jumped. He hadn't heard Chase coming. This wasn't unusual. Chase could be sneaky when he wanted to be. I think so. Seth had surrendered to the fact that it was Lacey, but he wasn't ready to admit it. When Chase didn't say anything else, Seth turned to look at him, curious about what he was thinking, but he'd vanished again. Seth couldn't really blame him. He turned his eyes back to the manure pile, and something snapped him into action. He didn't want to get any closer to her than this. He didn't know what would happen, exactly, but he knew enough to know it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe to be her hero. But he couldn't let Burke be her hero. He nearly bolted for the manure pile and beat Burke there by a hair. Burke gave him a dry look that said, if I'd known you were coming, I wouldn't have worked so hard to get here. If Seth hadn't been so distracted by Lacey, he would have felt bad for making his recovering brother work so hard. She was sitting up now, but she was looking down at her body. She didn't seem concerned that she'd gotten poop on her dress, she only looked a bit stunned, as if she were trying to figure out what had just gone wrong with her high-speed four-wheeler dash across the prairie. Good old Lacey. Even now that she'd elevated her position in life, even though she was wearing a fancy dress, she still couldn't be bothered by a little poop. His heart warmed with affection, and he became furious with it. Stop it he scolded himself. He was too nice, too soft, too quick to forgive. He needed to be stronger. But what was she doing here? Now that he'd beaten Burke in the world's most awkward foot race, he didn't know what to do next. He was less than two feet from her, but she hadn't seen him yet. He wanted to help her up, but the old lacy would have been annoyed by that. Why wasn't she looking up? Had she hit her head? Suddenly, concern for her welfare overrode all the other emotions swirling around inside of him. Are you all right? Her head snapped up at his voice as if she really hadn't realized someone was there. She looked right at him, and the pink drained from her cheeks. The whole world froze. If the people in line were still complaining about the wait, he couldn't hear them. If the breeze was still moving the grass, he couldn't see it. If the children were still trying to kill each other, he didn't know it. For more than a year, he dreamed about this moment. Then he decided that dreaming about it was unhealthy, and he'd banished it from his brain. This banishment had led to a malignant bitter hatred, hatred for the heartache that still throbbed, hatred for the lost dream of their future together, and sometimes something close to hatred for Lacey. She had done this. To him. To herself. To them and she'd done it for a stupid, shallow reason. Maybe she deserved to be sitting here in this manure pile with dozens of people watching. And yet, he couldn't let that continue. He extended his arm. Would you like a hand? He tried to smile and couldn't. He was too shaken, caught somewhere between anger and enchantment. Here she was, right in front of him, looking more beautiful than he'd ever seen her. She stared at the hand as if it were some kind of trick. She made no move to take it, which shouldn't have surprised him. Maybe she hadn't changed that much. But he gave her a second to reconsider. 
he didn't want to drop his arm if she wanted to take it. That would be mean, wouldn't it? It wobbled a little as if his arm muscles felt his doubt. Sorry, she said, so quietly that he almost missed it. Sorry? Sorry for what, exactly? For being on his brother's ranch? For hijacking a four-wheeler? For crashing into the manure pile? Or for breaking his heart and ruining his life? She finally reached up and took his hand, and a shock shot up his fingers, up his arm, and into his brain. His whole body tingled. The shock of it almost made him pull away, but she had a hold of it now, and so he managed not to yank his hand out of her grasp. Without looking for it, he noticed the absence of a ring on her hand. His heart jumped in his chest. Was Lacey not married anymore? Chapter 9 Lacey's landing had knocked the wind out of her, but other than that, she thought she was okay. Physically, anyway. She was still gathering data regarding her social condition. Embarrassment made her lie there a few minutes longer than she needed to. Finally, she had decided that she had to stop stalling, and she slowly sat up. Only then did she realize that she was in a manure pile. It looked like only horse apples, though, thank goodness. Could have been much worse, though she didn't think many people booked weddings on chicken farms. The manure was all over her dress and her hands, but she didn't see any blood or broken bones. She would live. She felt someone staring at her. A little afraid to look, she lifted her eyes anyway, and then her blood ran cold. No. Why was he here? He wasn't at the wedding, but he was lurking behind it in the horse barn? How did that make any sense? She sat there frozen, a weird mixture of fear and shame holding her in an icy grip. Would you like a hand, he asked, his voice even, his pose rock steady, his eyes like lasers burning into hers? He was the best-looking man she'd ever seen, and for some crazy reason, God had made him sweet too. Or maybe that was his mama's doing. Either way, it was an impossible combination. And she'd thrown it away. And for what? She'd acted out of fear, not faith, not hope, and certainly not love, and she hated herself for it. Sorry, she whimpered, and he blinked. Sorry? She'd been waiting, praying, for this moment for how long, and that's what she had come up with? Two weak and wobbly little syllables. She wanted to lie back down, roll over, and tunnel into the manure pile head first. Then she could spend the rest of her life there. It was what she deserved. But instead, she reached out and took his hand, and it gave her the strangest sensation. It felt familiar and comfortable, but also new and dangerous. How could she be feeling such conflicting things at once? What a mess she was. He pulled her to her feet with a strength that made her feel like a feather. In fact, he pulled her a little too hard because he pulled her body all the way into his. It felt a little like flying, and she gasped for air as her body met his and his arm came around her waist. His expression was impassive, she couldn't tell if he'd meant to pick her up like that or not, but then he had said, sorry steadied her on her feet, and stepped back swiftly. He didn't look away, though, and she couldn't either. They stood there, eyes locked, not speaking, not moving. Is this guy bothering you, Tonia? Kelly shouted from close by. Oh, yeah, Lacey had sort of forgotten that her new bestie existed. She hadn't had time to worry whether Kelly had survived the crash, but it seemed that she had and it seemed she'd come out of it mostly unscathed. She showed no signs of injury except for a fat lip. Her dress, however, had not fared so well. The bottom half of it had been ripped off, leaving her wearing nothing but a pair of skivvies and what, out of context, appeared to be a rather extravagant lime green blouse. Seth didn't even look in her direction, but behind Seth, Burke said, what in the? No, no, Lacey said. He's not bothering me. Who's Tonia? Burke cried as if that were the most bothersome part of this scene. A woman came rushing toward them. Are you okay? Are you okay? Lacey ripped her eyes off Seth to answer her. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. But the woman didn't take her word for it, running her hands down her arms as if she were looking for hidden fractures. 
When she didn't find any, she brought her face closer to Lacey's and stared into her eyes. Are you sure? Are you dizzy? Confused? Yes, she was both of these things, but that had nothing to do with the four-wheeler crash. I'm fine. Really? The woman turned to Kelly and gave her the same treatment. Then she invited them both into the house to get out of the heat and get some water. Lacey thought probably she was just trying to hide the bridesmaid in her underoos. That's not necessary, Seth said, his sternness sending a chill down Lacey's spine. She's okay. The woman turned a glare on Seth that nearly made Lacey laugh aloud. Excuse me? Seth didn't flinch. She's fine. With obvious disgust, the woman turned her back on Seth and looped her arm through Lacey's. I'm glad you're fine. Let's go inside for a bit anyway. We'll find your friend some pants. Gently, Lacey pulled away. I really am okay. When it was clear the woman didn't believe her, Lacey added, I just wanted to ride a horse. Kelly's face lit up, so Lacey hurried to add, but you can still take her in for a checkup. And you know, to find some pants. This could be her chance for an escape. The woman hesitated but then stepped back. Okay. If you change your mind, have one of the guys find me. I'm a nurse, and I'm never completely off duty. She smiled and then swept Kelly toward the house. Lacey was glad the nurse hadn't looked at her feet. She would have insisted on first aid. Seth was still staring at her. Lacey looked at him, but couldn't bear the heat of his gaze so she looked away again. Hudson is dating a nurse? Hudson married a nurse. You've been gone a while. She felt his anger and let it sting. She deserved it. Chapter 10 Seth's anger was a fire trying to burn its way out of his chest. What are you doing here, Lacey? She returned those gorgeous eyes to his, those two blue oceans, the water sparkled in the sunlight, trying to douse his fury. He concentrated on fanning the flames. You don't know these people, he accused. You don't know that. And yet he did. You were never a good liar, Lace. She sighed. I wanted to see you. He started to ask why and then stopped himself. He could think of a few reasons why she might want to see him, and none of them were things he wanted to deal with. I tried calling. I texted. I even sent emails. Now she was the one getting angry, which made his fury burn hotter. Don't you dare get mad at me. I don't owe you anything. He stepped back and turned away from her. He had things to do. He headed toward the barn and his horse. When he heard the four-wheeler start up again, for one panicked second he thought Lacey was going for round two, but a quick glance told him that Chase had righted the machine and was driving it behind the horse barn, probably to hide it. Fine, she called after him. I'll leave. But can you just get me to my car? What? That didn't make any sense. Lacey was the most independent woman he'd ever known. He turned back. Where is your car that you can't get there by yourself? She didn't say anything, and he could tell she was trying to maintain a poker face, but he could still read shame on it. She hadn't changed that much. But what was she ashamed of? His eyes searched her for clues and eventually came to her feet. What happened, he cried before he could stop himself. I, sort of lost my shoes. Lost your shoes? How? Where? She didn't answer him. How long ago had she lost her shoes? It was obvious that her feet had been bleeding a while, and yet she just kept walking around in the tall grass? What was wrong with her? And then suddenly, he knew why she'd been on the four-wheeler. Though it still didn't explain the speed at which she'd been traveling. You should really go in the house and see Evelyn. Who's Evelyn? Come on. He didn't want to pick her up, but he had to, and only once she had her hands clasped behind his neck did he realize how intimate the situation had become. He tried to walk faster, but she was heavier than he remembered. This didn't seem right as she didn't look like she'd grown. She sensed his struggle. Sorry. I've been working out. When he didn't reply, she added, Tony had a gym in his house. 
one of the only. Do we really need to talk about him? Seth had never hated anyone, but he'd come close to hating Tony. His name burned Seth's ears even all these years later. Sorry. She sounded like she meant it. It seemed to take forever, but he reached the house. As he struggled to open the door, Lacey said, You can put me down now. Her tone suggested she didn't like being carried. This made him want to keep carrying her. I've got it. She reached down to help with the doorknob, and he almost dropped her. I've got it, he snapped, his muscles starting to burn. If he'd known this moment was coming, he would have done some working out on his own. The door opened, and he thought maybe he'd had some angelic assistance, but then he realized that Hudson had opened it from the inside. Who's running the horseback rides? Hudson was already past panicking. Are you kidding me? I don't work for you. Lacey winced as he set her down in a kitchen chair, though he didn't know if it was from pain or embarrassment. He decided he didn't need to know. He squared himself to Hudson. You have lost your mind, and you're going to drive Chase away. His words, far harsher than usual, stunned Hudson into silence, and Seth left the house, trying not to care about what was going to happen next for Lacey. He hoped she would drive away before he had a chance to say, goodbye, again. By the time he reached the barn, he felt guilty for speaking so sharply to Hudson, but really, the man was losing it. He might have spoken the truth too harshly, but it had been the truth. Despite one child's close call with a racing four-wheeler, the children were still running wild around the front of the barn. And the three horses were missing. Seth looked at Burke. Where are the horses? Chase took the next two people. You're kidding. Seth couldn't believe it. He wasn't happy about it, Burke said, but I think he was just trying to make sure I didn't do it. You don't have to be out here, you know. I know you want to help, but really, how much worse can this get? Burke shook his head. Don't say that, man. Don't say that. He looked uncomfortable sitting in the hot sun, but he made no move to leave. I'm okay. And I'm probably not the one you should be worried about. Seth didn't know what that meant. Was Burke saying that he should be worried about Chase? Or Lacey? Burke glanced at the back of the house. I don't need to worry about her either, Seth said. I don't know what she's doing here, but she's leaving soon. She told you what she's doing here. She came to see you. Oh great. So people had heard that. Well, I think I might have talked her out of that. Or at least he hoped so. Burke gave him a knowing smirk that Seth didn't appreciate. Really? You think carrying her to the house was a big discouragement? Shut up. She's not wearing a wedding ring. Seth grunted, not wanting to admit that he'd noticed that as well. He saw Chase coming and distanced himself from Burke before Burke could say anything else annoying. Burke had always been his least favorite brother, and just because he'd been injured and had forgotten half of his life didn't mean that Seth was going to let him push him around. Chase looked miserable. He dismounted swiftly and handed the horse off to Seth. His face was pale, and his hands were shaking. Seth didn't say anything to him because he knew there was nothing he could say to make it better. Chase disappeared, and Seth helped the next two riders mount up, then they were off, and he tried to pay attention to the ride, to their route, to the two people he was guiding, but he couldn't stop thinking about Lacey. Those deep blue eyes. Those full lips. That thick blonde hair. He shook his head. He had to stop thinking like that. She had made her choice a long time ago. He'd worked hard to get over her. He didn't want to go backward. He couldn't let that happen. Chapter 11 Hudson's new wife, whom Lacey had decided she liked quite a bit, walked her back out to the horse barn. Hudson had insisted that she still go for her ride. He didn't know that she'd never really wanted a ride in the first place. She knew that Hudson was only trying to be nice, but she questioned what Seth was going to think about it. Alongside Evelyn, Lacey walked toward the answer to that question, but she was still looking for a getaway. When Seth came into view on the back of that horse, her stomach dropped into her borrowed boots. He had never looked so good. 
she realized Evelyn was staring at her and forced her eyes away from the coming cowboy. She glanced instead at the line of wedding guests waiting for their turn. I really don't have to do this. I don't want to cut anyone. Just go for a quick ride. I'll explain the cutting. I think Hudson is worried that you are going to be upset with him over the four-wheeler incident, so he's trying to butter you up. Why would she be upset with him? She was the one who had hopped on the back of a stolen four-wheeler. But she didn't really want to call attention to that distinction. Seth rode up, looked at her feet, looked at her face, and said, Now what? before dismounting. His sharp tone made her more than ready to walk away, and she tried to do just that, but Evelyn caught her arm. We got Lacey all cleaned up, all patched up, and she has borrowed my boots, Evelyn said to Seth, so she's going next. She had also borrowed Evelyn's clothes, and the shorts were too short. She pulled the hem down self-consciously. Evelyn gave her a gentle shove in the horse's direction and then went to explain to the people waiting why Lacey was going first. She was a close friend of the family. The explanation didn't make much sense. Did being a friend of the family mean that she could come ride a horse anytime? If so, then she didn't need to do it during their wedding reception. There was a squabble as the people in line made it clear that nobody wanted to ride alone. No one wanted to be the third wheel for her and Seth, and she couldn't blame them. They were mostly couples. Why would they agree to be split up? Seth looked at Evelyn, obviously upset, but he didn't say anything. Instead, he offered Lacey a hand. I can get on a horse. She mounted and then waited expectantly. He mumbled something. She wasn't sure, but she thought he'd said, I know that. They started riding, and Lacey waited until she was out of earshot to say, so when you're angry with someone, you still keep it to yourself? His jaw tightened. Don't psychoanalyze me. You don't know me. I know you. Have you changed that much in three years? I don't want to talk, Lacey. Why are you even here? She giggled dryly. You don't want to talk, but then you ask a question like that? My bad. You're right. I don't want to talk. He pushed his horse into a trot, and she rolled her eyes. As if this was going to stop her. She started trotting too and easily caught him, but she let the silence rest on them. She didn't really know what to say anyway. She'd come to ask him for a second chance, and she'd already blown it with her grand entrance. So maybe there was nothing left to say. Suddenly, he pulled up. We turn around here. Okay. She turned around, but his horse wasn't moving. Seth was staring at her, and his anger was obvious. Go ahead, she said. Spit it out. You'll feel better. Once again, you're not my shrink. Just because you like to say whatever you think without worrying about anyone else's feelings, doesn't mean the rest of us have to live like that. Oh, please, she cried, exasperated. I don't do that. He raised an eyebrow. No. Could have fooled me. Maybe he hadn't changed, but she had. A little, at least. It was true that the version of her that he had known had been strong and sassy, but a lot of that strength had been drained out of her since then, leaving nothing in its place but an aching emptiness. Tell me, and I'll go. Tell you what? Tell me off. Tell me why you're mad. Tell me how mad you are. Just tell me something. He glared at her. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction. What? She snapped. Is that why you came all this way? So that I could say something mean and punish you? That was so far from making sense that she had no idea how to respond to it. You're feeling guilty, he explained. Yes, of course she was feeling guilty. She had felt guilty every day since the day she'd left him behind. But that wasn't why she wanted him to yell at her. She genuinely thought it would be good for him. If I'm not allowed to head shrink you, then you don't get to do it to me either. A smile played on his lips, which made her proud. Fair enough. He finally started riding again, and she fell along beside him. Not much time left, she said, trying to sound playful. Want me to lurk around the barn when we get back? I'm not mad at you, Lacey, he said loudly, his voice completely void of play. 
It's been too long. I'm over it. I have nothing left to give you, not even anger. He sounded tired. If this were true, then she was in worse shape than she thought. She had known that she might have to convince him to forgive her, but maybe she was too late. Maybe they were past his hurt and anger. Maybe he was indifferent to her now, and that seemed a much harder mountain to surmount. Chapter 12 When Lacey rode past Seth and headed straight for the barn, he was amused. Good old stubborn Lacey. But then he was annoyed that he was amused. He didn't need to be charmed by her. Look where that had gotten him so far in life. Nowhere good. Fine, let her ride off in a humph. They could get back to the barn, and then she could ride off into the sunset. Again. He saw the danger far in advance and tried to talk himself out of it. No kid would be that stupid. The four-wheeler accelerated, yes, there was a kid who would be that stupid. Seth opened his mouth to shout, but who could he shout to? Burke was on the other side of the barn, and even if Burke could hear him, then what? What was Burke supposed to do? He wasn't wearing a jet pack. And Chase was probably hiding inside the barn. Lacey might be able to hear him, but what could she do? And so, knowing it was futile, Seth hollered at the kid on the stolen four-wheeler, the kid who was still accelerating. Stop. Seth cried, waving one arm back toward the barn. He felt foolish, like tapping a criminal on the shoulder on his way in to rob the bank, but he couldn't just do nothing. The kid was going to get hurt, and that was going to hurt the ranch. Normally, Seth would care more about the kid than the ranch, but he wasn't having a normal day. Stop, he cried again, standing in the stirrups as if that small gain in height was going to do something. But it did do something. The kid's eyes widened, and he slowed down. Thank God. But then he veered off, away from Seth, heading straight for Lacey instead. This kid was a true lunatic. Lacey turned around to investigate the approaching motor, and Seth rode harder to catch up to the pending catastrophe, not knowing what he was going to do when he got there. He didn't have a rope, or he would lasso that kid right off his seat. But Seth was too late. The young teen jerked the four-wheeler to his right, away from the horse, and then inexplicably, back to the left, aiming to cut the trotting horse off. The startled mare reared up. Lacey's left arm flew up like a bronc rider, and she managed to hold on as the horse pawed at the air, but she lost her balance when the horse crashed back down, sliding off its front shoulder, directly into the path of the stupid four-wheeler. Seth's gut plummeted as he rode even harder. He reached her in seconds and slid off his own horse before it had even stopped. He fell to his knees beside his lost love, but she was already sitting up and rubbing her head. He opened his mouth to ask if she was okay, but before he could untie his tongue, she said, You know, you always made me see stars, but this is something new. She smiled through her wince, trying to be tough when he knew it hurt. I seem to be having a rather clumsy day. It was as if the four-wheeler was trying to kill her, an ATV version of Christine. He'd always hated that movie, though his dad had loved it. He shook the thought away and stood to help Lacey to her feet. No hurry, he managed to say. Take your time. She raised an eyebrow. You sure? I thought you were in a hurry to get rid of me. She staggered, and he caught her elbow. I am, but let's make sure you're okay, first. She adjusted her shorts and then smoothed out her hair. Don't worry, I won't sue. I'm not worried about you suing, he said through clenched teeth. I'm worried that you just hit your head for the second time today. I didn't hit my head. She shook off his helping hand. Then why are you holding it? After she'd finished fixing her hair, she'd left her hand there. This news seemed to surprise her, and she dropped her arm. Not sure. It hurts, but I swear I didn't hit it. She rubbed the back of her neck. Feels more like whiplash. Seth looked up to see the four-wheeler fading in the distance and saw Chase coming toward them with Lacey's horse. Seth's horse had already circled back and was watching them, waiting patiently. Seth was almost scared to look at Chase. This hadn't been Seth's fault, but he still felt responsible. He shouldn't have let Lacey ride ahead. Chase looked Lacey up and down before saying. 
You want to ride back? I'll lead her, make sure she stays on the ground. Seth thought the question preposterous and was even more stunned when Lacey accepted the offer. She had trouble mounting this time, but Chase gave her a hand, sparking something too close to jealousy in Seth's chest. Chapter 13 Lacey woke up to a melee of voices, wondering why she was so cold. She realized she had an ice pack on her head and decided not to move. Keeping her eyes closed, she tried to figure out what all the fuss was about. It didn't take long to figure out that everyone was furiously mad at Hudson. When she heard that someone had called the sheriff about a stolen four-wheeler, she tried to smile, but it hurt her head too much. What are you doing here? Seth snapped. For one panicked second, Lacey thought that question was aimed at her, but then she heard a man's voice say, Olivia called me. You think I'm going to stay home while my brothers gang up on my wife? Lacey tried to think. Brothers? So this was a brother. Which one had been missing? She could easily rattle off the Honeywood brothers, she hadn't been gone that long, but her head was pounding, and her thinking was muddled. Wyatt. Wyatt was missing. Wait, so was Dustin. So which one was this? She couldn't imagine that Dustin had gotten married, so she went with Wyatt. Though it was almost as surprising that Wyatt had gotten hitched. He'd always been so focused on work. It was impressive that he'd found a woman who could get his attention. They're not ganging up on me, a woman said. She sounded tired. That's exactly what they're doing, the person she'd decided was Wyatt said. No, it's not, and if you keep saying so, they're all going to hate me because they're going to think that I said that. Now she sounded less tired, more angry. Fine. It came out more like a growl than a word. It's true, Hudson said. They're blaming me more than Olivia. They shouldn't be blaming anyone, Olivia said. We haven't done anything wrong. It's not our fault that this wedding party was a bunch of crazies. Olivia's courage made Lacey curious enough to crack one eye open. This Olivia had guts, and yep, that was Wyatt. Do we really need to have this conversation with Lacey on the couch? Seth asked. Everyone stared down at her, and she closed her one open eye. Lacey? Wyatt said. Lacey Flint? What does she have to do with any of this? She's a wedding crasher, Seth said. I can go. Lacey started to get up. Please don't. It was Hudson's voice, and it was more a command than a request. The please had just been for decoration. She fell back into the pillows. She didn't really want to be in the middle of this drama, but she was grateful he'd stopped her from moving out of it. A new burning sensation was forming in her lower back, and sitting up had sent several knives stabbing into it. The burning she could live with, the knives scared her a little. She can't go anywhere, anyway, Seth said. Not without somebody giving her a ride. I just meant maybe we could move this conversation somewhere else. I have a car, Lacey murmured. Not anymore, you don't, Seth said, sounding annoyed. Stevie drove off with it. She groaned. Actually, he didn't drive, Seth said. I think he'd had a few too many stolen drinks. He took off with that bridesmaid with half her dress missing. Lacey groaned again. She had a few too many too. Nah, a woman said. Lacey opened her eyes to see the nurse. I fed her. I think she was okay, by the time she left. Lacey realized it was dark outside. Whoa. How long had she slept? What time is it? Everyone ignored her. Chase, wait, Wyatt said. Then, five seconds later, he repeated himself. Apparently, Chase wasn't waiting. Chase, Burke said. Lacey couldn't see Chase from her position, but Wyatt's face relaxed, so Chase must have stopped walking. Sorry to ask this, Wyatt said, but can we please start from the top? I'm a little lost. No one said anything at first. It's not a bad idea, Olivia said. He's very level-headed. He can be objective. How objective can he be when you're his wife? Burke said. Hey. Wyatt nearly shouted. 
My wife is not to blame here. Fine. Seth raised his voice, which was rare, but he lowered it immediately to say, here's the short version. Chase is furious because Hudson and Olivia told this wedding party that they could have horseback rides, and then a crazy 12-year-old, who we now know was dipping into the punch bowl, which apparently had been spiked by another crazy bridesmaid, stole Hudson's four-wheeler, spooked Chase's favorite mare, and Lacey fell off. So now Hudson's worried about getting sued, and Olivia's trying to convince him that's not going to happen, and Burke is furious because Chase lives here and hasn't had any say in any of this. Seth took a breath. Did I cover all the bases? Most of them, yes. Now Hudson was the one sounding tired. Oh boy, Wyatt said, and the room fell silent. It seemed they were waiting for him to say something more, issue some sort of ruling or something. Chapter 14 Burke fought to control his temper. He was frustrated enough with his own life. Adding Chase's frustration on top of that made him feel as though he was ready to snap. Part of him wished that his wife were there to help steady him, but part of him was glad she wasn't there. She would remove him from the situation, for his own good, but he couldn't do that to Chase. Burke took a deep breath. I'll admit that I was not paying attention when you guys cooked this whole scheme up. But now I'm wondering if it's not a bit beyond us. It pained him to use the word us when he had nothing to do with any of this, but he was living in his brother's basement, and he didn't want to sound like he was attacking them. Hudson, you're a smart dude, obviously. Smarter than the rest of us. And Olivia, obviously you are a talented woman as well, but what made either of you think that you knew all the ins and outs of having an event center? Despite his efforts to be tactful, both of their faces made it clear that they felt attacked. So he hurried to add, I certainly wouldn't know. I'm not insulting you. It's just, we have no experience in any of this. He glanced at Chase, trying to gauge his reaction, but Chase's face was impassive as usual. Hudson, I think you are right to worry about getting sued. I'm not sure this is worth. We have insurance, Hudson said. We're not stupid. Burke hadn't known that. Good. That's good news. So then, about Chase. This was the part Burke really cared about. Might as well get to it. He looked at his younger brother. Chase? I don't want to speak for you. Chase shook his head slowly. I've already said everything I have to say. Burke didn't think this was true, but he believed that Chase thought it was. More likely Chase had said two words and walked away before making sure anyone had heard them. I know you're not trying to torture Chase, Burke said to Hudson, but Chase has been a pretty good sport with all of this. He lives in the barn now for crying out loud. He lets you have your big events that he stays out of the way of. What were you thinking, letting these people ride his horses? His horses aren't trained for that. And they are his horses. His voice was growing louder with each word, so he stopped talking and tried to regain control. Lewis lay in the corner, his head resting on his paws, watching the scene. When Burke finished his tirade, Lewis moaned as if in agreement. Or maybe he'd stolen too many scraps from the reception tent. I have already apologized for that ten times, Hudson said. You don't understand how fast this all happened. They were asking for lots of things, and we were trying to do a good job, trying to make their wedding the event of their dreams. You were over-delivering, Wyatt said. That's dangerous. We just wanted to make them happy, Olivia said. It was me. I'm the one who said they could ride the horses. I'm sorry. I don't know much about horses. I know that Chase has great horses, who are well-behaved, and I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. I don't doubt that I was wrong now, and I'm sorry. She sounded like she was on the verge of tears, and Burke's heart softened. It won't happen again. Wyatt protectively put an arm around her. It was a sweet sight, and Burke calmed down a little. I'm sorry, Olivia. I'm not trying to attack you. He hadn't known that she was the one to blame. But Hudson, Burke looked at his oldest brother. When you heard about that, you couldn't shut it down? By the time I heard about it, the entire wedding party was planning on it. You still could've shut it down. You know what? 
Hudson said. You've said your piece. I've apologized to Chase. I don't need to apologize to you. Can we please put this behind us? We obviously won't volunteer Chase's horses again. It's not just Chase's horses, Evelyn said quietly. How did they get the four-wheeler? And how did they steal it twice? It was a valid question, and Burke was impressed that Evelyn had dared to ask it. Again, we're learning as we go here, Hudson said. You're right, honey. It never occurred to me that someone would steal my four-wheeler, so I did leave the keys in it just like I always do. Then how did they steal it a second time? My fault, Chase said. I left the keys in it again. See what I mean? Burke said. We are simple men here. With the exception of Wyatt, we're not exactly business savvy. I would hardly call my doctor husband simple. Burke held up a hand. I didn't mean it as an insult. In my brain, simple is a good thing. He was just about done with these people. He'd done what he had come for. They had promised not to abuse Chase again. He has a good point though, Evelyn said. Burke startled. Who had a good point? Him? Which point? Had he made one? Hudson gave his wife a wary look. Oh, yeah, what's that? You are definitely in the black with this business. Maybe it's time to hire a specialist. Someone to think about things like bridesmaids spiking punch bowls and stealing four-wheelers. And don't forget the children of the corn, Seth said. Hudson actually laughed. You think there's a specialist for that sort of thing? What was their college major, hillbilly wedding security? Obviously annoyed, Evelyn said, no. But there are event managers. Hospitality majors. I don't know, but someone who does this full-time. Olivia has her catering business, and you are a full-time doctor. It is absolutely absurd that you are spending every weekend's day and night planning these events and then running these events. Tell the truth. How much did you sleep last night? Hudson did not answer her, which was answer enough. It's a good idea, Evelyn, Seth said. But I can't imagine who we are going to find like that in this area. No, you're right. Someone would probably have to relocate. So where are we going to put this person? Olivia said. The ranch is a bit crowded. Burke knew that she hadn't meant that as a dig at him, but he still felt the shame of it. He didn't like having to live in his brother's basement, and he and Ava were working hard to get out of there as fast as they could. She can have my room, Chase said. After a startled silence, Hudson said, don't say that. This is your home, Chase. I don't want you moving out. If you want us to shut this down, you say the word. There was a heavy pause, and then Chase said, shut this down. Chapter 15 Chase sat in his recliner in the tack room that had become his living quarters. He had tended to the horses, and miraculously, they had all survived the day without harm. At least not physical harm. He thought his mare had endured some mental injury, but it would be hard to prove that. He was exhausted. It felt like his brain had been stretched from east to west and then again from north to south. He just closed his eyes when someone knocked on his door. He didn't move. He was well within his rights to ignore that. He did not owe anyone a conversation. Not ever, and especially not after the day he'd had. They knocked again. It was pretty obvious he was in here. His truck was parked outside. The lights were on. He could pretend to be asleep, but his family knew he was the lightest sleeper in the world. The third time they knocked, Chase registered that it was a feminine knock. He didn't know if it was Olivia, Ava, or Evelyn. He couldn't imagine what he'd done to end up on a ranch full of women. He'd volunteered to live a recluse life surrounded by animals instead of people and then somehow, his brothers had filled the ranch full of their brides. He was pretty sure it wasn't Lacey Flint, who had shown up out of nowhere to jump into his manure pile and then leap off his horse. What was she doing here? He wondered briefly before deciding he didn't care. He got up to open the door. It was Olivia. This was disappointing. I don't really have the energy to talk, live. 
I know, she said softly, and I'm sorry to ask it of you. But if I wait till morning, I'll lose my nerve. He studied her for a second. What could she possibly have to say to him that would take any amount of nerve? He'd thought they had a pretty good relationship. He stepped aside to let her enter, and she did. He returned to his recliner and looked at her, waiting for her to talk. She took a big breath. I know we haven't been family for long, but please know that I do love you. He waited. With an intro like that, the main point was likely to sting. And Hudson really, really loves you. He waited. And he's willing to shut the whole thing down. Right now he's making a list of future bookings, so that tomorrow morning, he can call them all and cancel. She paused, obviously expecting some reaction from him, but he didn't have one to give. Chase, we have a wedding here next weekend. Do you know what it's going to do to that couple to have their venue cancel one week in advance? We will get sued for that one. What did she want from him? This was his house. At least half of it was. He paid half the mortgage. And think about that young couple. They have their hearts set on this place. He couldn't care less about that couple. They didn't even feel like real people to him. Chase, please don't make him do this. He searched her face for ulterior motives, but didn't find any. Fine. We can keep the bookings for this summer. It physically hurt him to say that, but she was right. The Honeywoods, of which he was a part, for better or worse, had given their word. And it would be wrong for them to break it. Do we have anything booked beyond September? She nodded. Next summer is booked. Seems we would be fine to cancel those. They have all winter to find a new place. And what else was there to do during a South Dakota winter? She gave him a small nod. Thank you. I'll tell him, and he'll be relieved. Please don't encourage him to come out here and thank me. I'm going to bed. She smiled. I won't. And I think he knows better, anyway. He waited for her to leave. Did he have to get up and walk her to the door? It was only ten feet away. Anything else? She nodded, but there was a long wait before she told him what the anything else was. I'm hoping you will reconsider. Do you have any idea how much money you're making right now? These people are paying a lot of money to be here. I don't care anything about money. I know you don't, she said quickly. But you care about your animals. More money will make it so you can have even more animals and take even better care of them. His chest tightened. She was trying to persuade him, and he hated that. I am only one man. A man can only care for so many animals. And I couldn't possibly take better care of them than I already do. She nodded. I understand. But maybe you could hire some. Liv, he interrupted. It's late, and I'm tired. Okay. She quickly stood. I'm sorry. And thank you for letting me talk. It's just. I'm not super motivated by money either, but it seems stupid to just throw it away. This business that you and Hudson have, it's going to build a nest egg for you. You'll never have to worry about money ever. You'll be able to do whatever you want, help whoever you want, she saw that her words were having no effect, and she stopped talking. She turned to the door. Good night, Chase. Feeling guilty, he jumped up to get the door for her. Good night. He shut the door behind her and then stared at it. She was right. He shouldn't take this opportunity away from Hudson. He was going to have to leave. He was going to have to move. He turned and leaned against the door. But where could he go? If it were just him, it wouldn't be so complicated, but it wasn't just him. He had a whole string of horses to think of, and he wasn't willing to give any of them up. But he couldn't afford a place of his own, not one with the land he needed. He closed his eyes and tried to breathe deeply. He was trapped. Again. Chapter 16 Let me call my mom, Lacey said. She'll come get me. Everyone had left except Seth, and Lacey had managed to sit up on the couch. She was trying not to show it, but her lower back was killing her. 
Hudson gave me strict orders to keep you here. He smiled clumsily. Well, I guess I should say that he wanted me to extend hospitality and make you feel like a valued guest. That sounds better than keep you here. But he wants you to stay, at least until he's confident that you're okay. I'm not going to sue you, she said for the fiftieth time. I know that. But something in his tone suggested that he didn't know that. Not for sure. She studied him. Did he really think she was that low? Sure, she had broken up with him after promising him forever, but people broke up with people all the time. She hadn't done anything that evil. Well, fine. I'll sleep here. Her mother was probably already in bed, anyway. But you should go home. He nodded. I will soon. I just wanted to make sure you are all settled in. So let's get you into the guest room. A real bed did sound good. She tried to stand and didn't quite make it. Despite herself, she cried out in pain. He grabbed her hips and held her in place. Whoa. Sorry. I didn't realize it was that bad. She whimpered. It's not, but her voice was strained with the pain, making her sound like a big, fat liar. Might be easier to go back down. He helped her lower herself back to the couch, but she really didn't want to stay there. If she had an actual back injury, she didn't think a couch was the healthiest place to be. Just give me a minute, and I'll try again. The bed really does sound inviting. She tried to laugh, but even that hurt. I could carry you. She did not want that to happen. Not again. What had happened to her? She had shown up at this stupid wedding a strong independent woman and just being in Seth's vicinity, had turned her into a whimpering fool. That won't be necessary. Without further discussion he stood and slid his left arm under her upper back. Seth, please. I can do it. He slid his right arm under her knees. This might hurt a little. Sorry. I'll try to go quickly and smoothly. He hoisted her into the air, and oh boy, it did hurt. She tried to keep from crying into his ear and barely managed. He did move swiftly though, and soon she was on the bed, tears streaming out of the corners of her eyes. She tried to say thank you, but the words came out like croaks. You're welcome. Barely moving her legs, he gently lifted one foot to pull Evelyn's cowboy boot off. This awakened the pain in her foot, which did nothing to distract from the pain in her back. I cannot believe how many injuries I have. He laughed, and it sounded genuine. I know. You had an unlucky day. He didn't know the half of it. Did you know that crazy bridesmaid, he asked. No, I sure didn't. And she wasn't going to admit that she missed her a little. Seth moved on to her second foot. This one hurt even worse, and she was grateful God had chosen to gift humans with only two feet. You two sure seemed close, Seth said, and she didn't know if he was teasing. She thought I was someone else, and I was afraid of correcting her. I didn't want to cause a scene. Little did I know that keeping up with the ruse would cause the biggest scene of my life. Oh, I don't know, you caused quite a scene when you tore your ACL. I did not. She remembered the moment perfectly. It was sharp and clear in her mind. She had been stoic, though it had hurt like the Dickens. It was my mother who caused a scene that time. She had run out onto the field like a lunatic, ready to throttle whoever had hurt her baby. He chuckled. I guess you're right. And I might have caused a scene too. She remembered then how he had fussed over her, and her chest grew warm. Her senior year in high school. She'd been the best player on the team, one of the best players in the conference, but tearing that one ligament had ended her soccer career. It had been the first disappointment in a long list of disappointments. She hadn't gotten into the college she wanted, and then she'd missed valedictorian by a hundredth of a point. He stood up and looked down at her. Are you comfortable sleeping in those clothes? He shifted his weight. I could go find Evelyn? I'm sure she'd be willing to help you change. The last thing Lacey wanted was to bother anybody else again. She had asked for enough from the Honeywoods today. I'm fine. 
But really, let me call my mom in the morning, and I'll get out of your hair. I'm sorry, Seth. I don't know when Hudson will be willing to let you go, but I'll leave that up to you too. I won't be here in the morning. She didn't know what to say to that, so she watched him leave silently and then she wept into the pillow, and her tears had nothing to do with her many physical injuries. Chapter 17 Seth drove away from his brother's ranch with a heavy heart. He hadn't wanted to drive away at all. He hadn't wanted to leave the house, to leave the guest room. He'd wanted to cuddle up beside Lacey and hold her tight until she felt better, and this made him furious with himself. How big of a fool was he? How big of a fool did he want to be? It was like he was trying to get his heart broken. What an idiot. And what was she doing there? He'd spent that much time with her and hadn't gotten an answer to that basic question. Not a real one, anyway. She'd wanted to see him. But what did that mean? He pulled his truck over to the side of the road and sat there in the dark. What am I doing? Why had he pulled over? Because, eh, you idiot, you're thinking about turning around. No, he wasn't. He put the truck in drive. He was going to go home. He had a nice home, and he liked being there. So put your foot on the gas and get there. The truck continued to idle, mocking him. She'd wanted to talk to him, but about what? Why hadn't she said? Did you give her a chance? No, not really. He'd been too angry, but he had every reason to be angry. Maybe he could turn around, go back and say, this is your one chance. Say what you came to say, and then I'm leaving. Then he would know. Then he wouldn't have to wonder. But would that make him look weak? It would certainly make him feel weak. So which was worse, the annoyance of not knowing what she wanted to talk to him about or the embarrassment of being a total wuss? He stomped on the gas and his truck lurched back onto the road. He could live without knowing. He wasn't going to compromise his dignity. Not for any woman ever again. Especially not for Lacey Flint. But even after he'd gotten home and climbed into his comfortable bed, his brain was still spinning. He stared at the ceiling for a long time, trying not to think about Lacey, trying not to figure out her motivations, and failing. So he propped himself up on some pillows and turned on the television. But he couldn't find a show compelling enough to fully distract him and so he gave up and closed his eyes, surrendering to the hamster wheel of racing thoughts. He deserved this mental torment. He never should have engaged with her. He never should have helped her out of the manure pile. This was his punishment for that mistake, and he wouldn't make it again. Eventually, he slipped into a fitful sleep, waking several times during the wee hours in the morning before finally falling into a deep sleep just before dawn. Less than three hours later, he woke up to his phone ringing and wanted to kick himself for not thinking to put it on silent. For one crazy second, he expected it to be Lacey calling, but then he saw that it was Hudson. Hello, he said groggily and then cleared his throat. Sorry to wake you up. Rough night? Seth groaned. What's wrong? I was hoping you could come out here and talk to your girlfriend. She's not my, his words morphed into a growl. I know. I was trying to be funny. You failed. Why do you want me to talk to her? Because she is in terrible shape. I need to get her in for x-rays, and she is refusing to go. She has called her mother to come get her, but we're not even going to be able to get her into the car. She can't even get up. What? Seth cried, his grumpiness now replaced with concern. What's wrong with her? I don't know. That's why I need to get her in for x-rays. Did she break her back or something? It's her back, right, not her head? It's her back, and like I said, I don't know exactly what's wrong with her. She can't walk? Was that even possible? That had to mean something was broken, right? She's not paralyzed. I'm not sure she is physiologically unable to walk. But when she tries, the pain is bad enough that she can't make her muscles obey her brain. This didn't sound realistic. Lacey was the toughest woman he'd ever known. She never showed pain. She was like Burke with a dress on. 
he winced when he realized that he'd once been in love with a woman with the same personality as the brother who drove him nuts. Was she faking? Was that possible? No, Lacey wouldn't do that. She would never be willing to admit helplessness, let alone fake it. Hudson was waiting for an answer. I don't know what you expect me to do. Talk some sense into her, he said as if he'd been expecting that argument. Sometimes it was annoying how well his brothers knew him. I'm not sure I can. And he was sure he didn't want to. Her mother's on the way, right? Let her deal with it. Seth, I'd like to get to church eventually. I don't want to be trapped in my house dealing with the two most stubborn women on the planet. And it's really not my fault that she's here. Yes, it was his fault. That barn had not attracted any wedding crashers before Hudson had transformed it into a yuppie magnet. And Hudson was the one who had insisted that she spend the night. They should have let her go home with her mother the night before, when she could still walk. So you're coming? He wanted to say no, but he couldn't do that to Hudson. Can I talk to her on the phone? Yeah, hang on. He heard rustling and then Lacey's voice, and his heart melted. What's going on, he asked. I heard Hudson talking. Okay, so why won't you go get x-rays? I know you can afford it. I can't, actually. What? What did that mean? But that's not why I don't want to go. I don't need x-rays. It's muscular. I can tell. Oh, you're a doctor now? Did you finish medical school in the last three years? He couldn't keep the snark out of his voice. No. But I know my own body. I don't need x-rays. I just need to get home and rest. Fine. He sighed. I'm coming over to get you into your mother's car. She didn't say anything. Okay? She hesitated. I want to say that I don't need your help, but I'm afraid that I do. At least, I'm going to need someone's help, and it would be even more embarrassing to get it from Hudson. Okay. Nobody needs to be further embarrassed. Hang on. I'll be right there. He got up and got dressed. So much for his vow to stay away from her. Chapter 18 Lacey handed the phone back to Hudson and then tipped her head back into the pillows and closed her eyes. How had it come to this? She'd never been so humiliated in her life. Evelyn had given her Tylenol, ibuprofen, coffee, and a banana, and she tried to be patient as she waited for the concoction to kick in. She hoped the combo would give her the stamina to get into her mother's car on her own power. Well, Hudson Honeywood, her mother chirped from the kitchen. It's been too long. Lacey sighed. She loved her mother, but she was worried that her good cheer might annoy Hudson and Evelyn. Her mom appeared in the bedroom doorway. Despite the smile she still wore, there was concern etched on her face. Oh, honey. She hurried to the bed and took Lacey's hand. I'm okay. Her mom's eyes ran down her body, landing on her bandaged feet. She gasped. What has happened to you? Oh, it is such a long story. Okay. I like long stories. Hudson says Seth is on his way to help? That's what I hear. Can I sit with you, or will that hurt you? You can sit. Lacey scooched over, trying not to show how much it hurt to do so. Her mom gingerly sat, now holding Lacey's hand with both hands. I tried calling Stevie, but he won't answer his phone, and his mom hasn't heard from him either. He ran off with the world's largest bridesmaid. Oh, honey, that's not nice. I'm sure that being a bigger gal, she was very self-conscious about being a bridesmaid. Hardly. Mom, I wasn't commenting on her weight. She was literally enormous. Like a seven-foot-tall nose tackle. I should know. This all started when she tackled me. Her mom gasped. A woman tackled you? Yeah, she didn't mean to hurt me. She was just excited to see me. Her mom was horrified. You know this woman? No. She thought I was someone else. Anyway, she was really nice. 
but when she tackled me, I lost my shoe, Lacey couldn't remember when she'd lost her second shoe. Anyway, so she had downed a bunch of spiked punch and then she wanted to go horseback riding, but my feet were cut up, so she stole. I mean, borrowed Hudson's four-wheeler to give me a ride, but she crashed into the manure pile, which is okay, because it made for a soft landing, and I was fine after that, but then a drunk tween tried to drive a four-wheeler into my horse, and I fell off. She paused for a breath. And this time there was no manure to cushion my landing. The story, or maybe the speed with which it had been delivered, had rendered her mother speechless. It wasn't the horse's fault. My mind was elsewhere, and I wasn't looking where I was going. Your mind was on Seth. Lacey shushed her mother. This house is full of honeywoods. They've all gotten married, so there are even more of them. Ironic. Seth was supposed to be the first one to get married. That's not true. Burke was already married when Seth and I had our first date. Oh, right. I forgot about Burke. She eyed her daughter. Anyway, I think that's when I hurt my back, Lacey said to distract her from more Seth talk. When you fell off the blameless horse, her mother said slowly, not when you were thrown from an ATV or when you were tackled by a linebacker bridesmaid? Nose tackle. Oh, whatever. Aren't they the same thing? I don't think so. But she didn't really know. Her football knowledge was mostly limited to what she'd learned from Friday Night Lights. She'd been a soccer player. Okay, so Hudson says we're going for x-rays? I don't need x-rays. It doesn't hurt that bad. Her mother's eyebrows went up. Oh, yeah, so you can get up and walk to my car without trouble then? Lacey was emboldened to try. Surely the Tylenol had kicked in by now, right? She took a deep breath and then tried to sit up, and she almost made it without exclamation. She wouldn't let herself fall back down, though. She'd come this far. So she forced herself onto her side, trying to get her legs close enough to the edge of the bed that they might fall onto the floor, but her mother was in the way. So she ended up lying on her side, folded at a 60-degree angle, trying to catch her breath. And this was how Seth found her. Chapter 19 Well, Seth Honeywood. Fiona Flint leapt to her feet and came for him. What a sight for sore eyes. He let the woman hug him for several seconds before gently pulling away. Nice to see you, Mrs. Flint. Oh. You know you don't have to call me Mrs. She enthusiastically patted him on the back. Well, the last time they'd had this conversation, she'd insisted he call her mom, and that sure didn't seem appropriate anymore. He shifted his attention to Lacey, who had somehow jackknifed herself on the bed. Why are you lying like that? I'm okay, she said before he'd finished asking the question. I can get up. Slowly, she moved her legs closer to the edge of the bed. You don't have to. I can carry you. The more he carried her around, the easier it got, physically, anyway. When she didn't stop moving, which was obviously a strain, he went to the bed and put a hand on her leg. Lacey, listen to me. Hudson isn't stupid. He's a good doctor. He got good grades in medical school. He's won awards. If he thinks you need x-rays, then you should get x-rays. A single tear slid from the corner of her eye. Instinct almost had him reaching out to wipe it away before he remembered that this wasn't his job anymore. Hadn't been for a long time. Let's get you to the car. I can do it. She sat up again, sort of. Okay, then do it, but I don't want to stand here all day watching you be stubborn. He didn't want to be there at all. Lacey looked up at him, the hurt clear in her blue eyes. Sorry, he said, meaning it. I'm not trying to be harsh, but Lacey, it feels, he had the right words, but he didn't want to admit his vulnerability. Unpleasant to be around you. So I'd rather. Unpleasant, she cried. Are you serious? He froze, not knowing how such a benign word had caused such offense. Why don't I give you two kids a minute? Fiona slid toward the door. I'll be right outside if you need me. She shut the door behind her, leaving them alone. Just be honest, Seth. 
You said you weren't mad, that you don't feel anything, but it's pretty obvious that you do. Be strong, he told himself. I am here to get you in the car. That's it. So get up, or I will pick you up because Hudson asked me to get you out of his house. She collapsed onto the bed and sobbed wordlessly. Guilt overwhelmed him, and he laid a hand on her shoulder, which she promptly shook off. Get away from me. I'm sorry that I bothered you. She wouldn't look at him. I wanted to see you. I wanted to apologize. I wouldn't have bothered if I'd known that you'd turned into such a jerk. She spat the word out, and it stung. I'm not a jerk, Lacey. He had a lot of flaws, but he wasn't a jerk. How can you possibly think I'm the bad guy here? She finally looked at him. Okay, fine. I'm the bad guy. I think everybody knows that. I left you because I didn't want to be poor my whole life. He staggered back a step. I didn't want to struggle and suffer and stress every minute of my existence like I've seen my mom do. Excuse me. But you know what? The joke's on me. Because guess what, Mr. Perfect? He left me. I'm a 25-year-old divorcee, so you can stop punishing me because I have already been punished for my mistake. Her head dropped back into the pillow, and her shoulders shook with sobs. So she was divorced. Seth had known that Tony was a terrible excuse for a man, but he hadn't thought he was that much of an idiot. Why would Tony have left her? Or thrown her out? She was gorgeous. She was fun. He'd been so lucky to have her. And he had divorced her? Please, go, she mumbled into her pillow. I'll call an ambulance. He didn't know what to do. Her words had cut him deeply, but he couldn't leave her like this. Not in this physical state. Not in this emotional state. He had accepted that they would never be together, but she was still Lacey Flint. She was still West Hope. She was still his people. You do know what to do. So do it. He didn't give her a chance to argue. He simply scooped her up into his arms. She whimpered in pain, but she didn't protest. He carried her toward the door and then wished that he'd opened it first. He knocked on the bottom of it with the toe of his boot. No one came to answer. Uh-oh, he said, and she giggled, erasing most of the tension between them. He'd never been so grateful for a giggle. He kicked the door again, a little harder. Mrs. Flint? Are you there? He didn't think she was the type to stand there with her ear pressed against the door, but he hoped she hadn't gone far. The door opened, and Evelyn smiled up at him. Fiona went outside. She said she would be waiting in the car. Seth carried Lacey outside, saw the size of Fiona's car, and changed his mind yet again. He walked to her window, which she promptly lowered. Your car is pretty small. I'll put her in my truck. You can ride with us if you want. She winked at him. I'll follow you. He nodded. Okay. Would you mind opening the truck door for me first? Oh, of course. With a determined swiftness she got out of her car and to his truck. He thanked her and then whispered to Lacey, hang on one more second. Still holding her, he reached in to recline the seat before gently placing her in it. Her body stiffened, and he straightened but stayed only inches away. When she didn't move, he said, is this going to be okay? We've still got miles to go. She nodded. It's okay. She exhaled. I'm okay. Thank you. Chapter 20 Thank you, Seth. Lacey watched West Hope go by her window in a mostly green blur. And I really am sorry. I'm sorry for what happened three years ago, and I'm also sorry for yesterday. She regretted using the word happened. It hadn't just happened. She had made a decision. And it had been a bad one. It's okay. Let's not dwell on it. Which it was he talking about? She was too tired and too overwhelmed to think about the former, so she focused on the latter. It seemed like such a simple plan. I thought I would just bump into you and act like it was coincidence. She laughed bitterly. 
you know, like make small talk. I could casually mention that I was divorced and then you could casually ask me out and then we could start over. She saw him jolt at her words. I now know how foolish that was. He didn't say anything for several miles. Then he broke the silence with, I'm sorry that you had to go through a divorce. Even though I was hurt and angry, I still wanted you to be happy. She laughed bitterly. That's ironic. You were more concerned about my happiness than I was. He gave her a perplexed look. What does that mean? I didn't go off with Tony because I was pursuing happiness. I was pursuing safety. And you didn't think I could keep you safe? He was getting angry again, and she really didn't want that. It hurt her to her very core. There are different kinds of safety. Yes, I know that you would do everything in your power to keep me safe from anything that threatened me. Or at least, you would have back then. But there are different levels of safety, and you have to admit that money provides a layer of security that nothing else can. I don't believe that for a second. This didn't surprise her. That's because you never went without food as a kid. You never watched your mother throwing up in the sink because of panic attacks she was having over money. For crying out loud, we lived in our car one summer. Seth looked at her sharply. You've told me about that time before. You thought it was great. Of course I did. I was a kid. I thought we were camping. When I became an adult, it didn't sound so fun. I just. Tony offered me this magical existence where I was never going to have to worry about money and all I had to do was be a good wife. And I'm sorry, but I took the bait. And that's what it was, wasn't it? Bait. You were baited into a trap. Yeah and you don't need to rub it in. That's not what I was trying to do. He heaved a big sigh as he pulled the truck into the parking lot of the Um. I'm sorry. I really didn't know that you were dealing with such a very real fear of poverty. She searched his words for judgment but didn't find any. His compassion surprised her. He put the truck in park. She looked up at the big glass doors that would soon slide open for her. Maybe I don't need to go to the um, maybe I should just get a doctor's appointment. He started to get out of the truck. If you can't walk, you need to go to the um. There are no doctors open on Sunday, and Hudson has already paved the way for this. He slammed his truck door and came around to her side. When he opened her door, she said, please, let me try it on my own. He nodded and stood back. She tried, but she couldn't even swing her legs around, and he stepped forward again. She started to protest, but he stopped her. I'm not going to pick you up. I'm just going to give you a hand. He put his hands on her waist and lifted her out of the truck before setting her gently down on her own two feet. She stood there frozen, not trusting her legs to hold her up, but they did. She was still bent forward at the waist, but it felt like progress. She looked up at him and smiled. Well, look at that. This might not be a season-ending injury after all. He chuckled and offered her his elbow. Let's get you inside, superstar. It was fun to be called a star again, even if he was only playing. It had been a long time since anyone had acknowledged that she had ever been good at anything. The going was slow, and a few times she had to admit to herself that it would have been easier to let him carry her but she wasn't going to admit that to him. A rush of air conditioning greeted them as they trudged through the doors. Seth pointed his forehead at a wheelchair. You want a ride? No, she said quickly. Sitting is the worst. She was pretty sure that wheelchairs didn't recline. He led her to a bank of chairs. I can go to the desk and explain, but you don't want to sit, so, his eyes asked her what she wanted to do and it was a pickle. Standing was awful, but she didn't know if she could sit. I guess I'll just wait here for you. He gingerly removed his arm from her hand and went to the desk. She stood alone, slightly bent at the waist, pain shooting down both legs, wishing that she had something to lean on. She tried to hear Seth's conversation and couldn't, but she trusted him to get the story right. She hoped he would leave out some of the details or people would be talking about this for months to come, HIPAA or no HIPAA. 
When he returned, he said, I told them that you can't really sit, and they said they would get you in as soon as possible. These words were meaningless. As soon as possible could be midnight. Thank you. They stood there awkwardly, only inches between them, not looking at each other. She wanted to grab onto him for support, but she didn't. I suppose you can go, then. My mother will be here soon. He looked at the door. Why isn't she here already? Lacey knew the answer to this, but she didn't want to share it. Her mom had always been Seth's biggest fan. She had thought Lacey was making the biggest mistake of her life when she ran off to Chicago with Tony. Her mom had been right, but back then Lacey had thought she was nuts. People didn't just marry their high school sweethearts and live happily ever after. But now, standing so close to the best-looking, sweetest man she'd ever known, happily ever after seemed so very within reach. If she hadn't already blown it. Chapter 21 Seth sat in the hospital waiting room staring mindlessly at the TV. It was on mute, but it didn't matter. He wasn't bothering to read the subtitles. He didn't even know what show was on. He was too busy analyzing Lacey. How could he have been so clueless back then? He had known everything about her. They had told each other everything, had a million private jokes. They'd known each other their whole lives. And yet she had this giant fear of being poor? Part of him didn't buy it. He tried to think back, searching his memory for signs. She had always talked about needing to get a career that would make her lots of money, but they had all said stuff like that in high school. He hadn't thought her desire to make money was any more passionate than anyone else's. He remembered how upset she'd been when she hadn't gotten into the college she wanted. He had found her disappointment to be a bit over the top, but he had chalked it up to female emotions. But now, looking back at it from a distance, that had been the silly assumption for him to make because Lacey wasn't a very emotional person. Or at least, she didn't show it. So why had he been so quick to blame her disappointment on her gender? Because it was easy, he admitted to himself. It was easier than trying to figure out why she was so upset. He looked down at his hands, suddenly ashamed. Maybe he hadn't done a good enough job taking care of her. Maybe he hadn't paid as much attention to her as he thought he had. But he had trusted her to be honest. When she had promised over and over that she told him everything, he had believed her. He hadn't realized he had needed to go looking for clues as if he were trying to solve a mystery. He should have been more sympathetic back then, but he was making up for it now. His heart was full of sympathy for her. He had never had to deal with any big fears, but he knew from talking to Chase that living with fears was not a rational process. So often Chase made decisions based on his fears without even realizing he was doing it. Maybe Lacey had done the same thing. She hadn't chosen to give in to her fear. It had just happened because of how she'd been wired when she was growing up. Poor Lacey. He stared at the double doors through which she had disappeared. She hadn't chosen Tony over him because she didn't love him. She had chosen Tony because that's what her fear had told her to do. It was still hard for him to believe, but at least it made some sense. It was better than thinking, as he had for the last three years, that she had just suddenly decided to love a stranger more than she loved him. But even with his new understanding that fear had been in play, maybe even been in charge, he still felt the sting of the fact that she hadn't believed he could provide a comfortable life for her. Granted, he had never shown big ambitions, had never wanted to be a doctor like his brother. But still. She had thought he wouldn't be able to make enough money to support them. That was quite an insult. Do you make enough money to support her? An annoying voice whispered in his brain. He thought about his most recent pay stubs and winced. He had never worried about money, was grateful for the money he made. He worked hard, and Dustin had pulled some strings to get him a decent job, but that annoying little voice had a point. Could he support a family on the wage he was making now? Maybe not. The doors opened automatically, and a second later Lacey appeared, sitting in a wheelchair being pushed by a man in scrubs. Whoa. Sitting up. He stood to greet her. She smiled. They gave me some good drugs. The person behind her smiled. She tried to resist, but
but when we promised her that she would be able to walk, she gave in. You can walk? She nodded. But they wouldn't let me walk out. The man pushed her through the doors and stopped. She's all yours. Seth took over. Okay. Thanks. Seth watched the man walk away, a little bewildered that he hadn't given him more information. Then he realized, why would he? Seth wasn't family. Mr. Scrubs probably wasn't even allowed to give Seth any info. So what do we know? They say I have several muscles in full spasm, but they won't know what the x-rays say until at least tomorrow. I guess they need some expert to read them. Seth wondered if Hudson would be able to read them faster. He started to push her chair and then stopped. Do you want to dismount, or should I push you all the way to the truck? She giggled. Dismount, she repeated and shook her head. You know what I mean. I do. I also know that these drugs are making me hungry enough to eat a raw buffalo heart. Please get me to my mother's house so I can raid her pantry. Hoping Mrs. Flint didn't keep raw buffalo heart in her pantry, he said, okay. But she hadn't answered his question. He stepped around so he could see her face and tried to read her expression. She reached up and clasped his forearm to pull herself to a stand okay, then, we're walking. She stood up, almost straight looking much better than she had on the way into the hospital. Then she started walking, still holding on to his arm. Uh. The truck is this way. She stopped, slowly turned, and sighed. He pointed. Right over there. In the exact opposite direction that she was headed. Those must be some drugs they'd given her. I just wasted so much energy on those three steps. He chuckled. Not too late to sit back down. She ignored this and started walking in the correct direction. So did they give you a prescription or just a single dose? Just a single dose. And that's okay. This stuff is strong. I don't want to mess with it too much. She spoke slowly. Not that I'm not grateful. I am. He helped her into the truck and then got behind the wheel. Do you want me to pull through a drive through My treat. It took her a long time to consider the offer and then she chuckled lazily. Oh that's right. Now that you own a fancy wedding venue, you've got money to burn. Seth's blood ran cold as his grip tightened on the wheel. Was that what this was? She'd been dumped by one rich guy and now she thought she could just hop back into his life? Well, the joke was on her. Hudson and Chase might be making a lot of money, but Seth sure wasn't. It's up to you, she continued. I'm cool with stopping if you want, but I don't need to. I can wait till we get home unless you want to stop. I'll get you home then. He tried to keep his voice even. Seems I've lost my appetite. Chapter 22 Lacey lay on her mother's couch watching good movies, but she missed Seth so much that it felt like her chest was being cracked open. What a fool she'd been, reopening that wound. How cocky she'd been to think he would just open his arms and welcome her back. Her mother perched on the edge of the couch, beside Lacey's feet, and looked at her. What are we watching? You don't have to stay up, Mom. I appreciate all you've done, but I know you've got to get to work early. She glanced at the television. You don't want to tell me what you're watching? Why, is it rated R? Lacey sighed. I'm 25 years old, Mom. I'm allowed to watch rated R movies. Doesn't mean that you should. She squinted at the television. Tony had always wanted her to keep the volume low, so Lacey had gotten used to watching things with subtitles on, and she was doing so now. What is this, she asked again. Marie Antoinette. Her mother looked at her. In English. Lacey giggled. That's her name. Oh. She clicked her tongue. Sounds familiar. Anyway, when do you start your new job? Is your back going to be better by then? It had better be. I think so. And I start Monday. Well I guess that's lucky. Not luck. That's just when the woman I'm replacing goes on maternity leave. Oh. So this is only a temporary job? 
Lacey sighed. She had already explained this. It might be, but they said that if I'm a good fit, they will probably be able to use me in a different position. And I will be a good fit. If I can stand up straight by then. Yes, honey. I'm sure you will be. She watched the show for several minutes, and Lacey had almost nodded off when she said, I'm so proud of you, honey. Lacey laughed bitterly. Are you serious? Which part are you proud of? That I crashed someone's wedding? Or that I managed to fall off a horse without health insurance? I don't think any horses have health insurance. Lacey didn't want to laugh, but she couldn't help it. Well, excuse me for bad grammar. I'm on hard drugs, you know. Although it sure did feel like those hard drugs were wearing off. She wasn't looking forward to that. I know you're all doped up. I was just teasing. Trying to lighten the load. What I meant was, I am proud of you for taking this job. I know that being a receptionist isn't anyone's dream job. But I'm proud of you for doing what needs to be done. You are a humble woman, and that makes me feel like I did a good job raising you. You did do a good job raising me, mom. That's why I have never been afraid of work. And there were far more humbling jobs than being a receptionist. She was going to be happy to sit in an air-conditioned office and answer phones. And I would have had a job in Chicago too if Tony had let me. It's not like I didn't want to work. I was always willing. I know, dear. Her mother patted her leg. I also know that divorce hurts, but it's probably good that you're rid of him. Yeah, probably. Now you're free for bigger and better things. Despite the drugs, Lacey heard the subtext. Don't get your hopes up, mom. Seth hates me. She exhaled slowly. And that's okay. I've never been single. It's time I give it a try. She thought she might be rather good at it. Doing her own thing. Making her own decisions. She had wanted another shot with Seth because she loved Seth, not because she was afraid of being alone. Nothing wrong with being single, dear, but I know you're in love with that man, and I just want you to be happy. She couldn't argue with that. Her mother knew her too well. Thanks, mom. She patted her leg again and stood. And you know you can stay here as long as you want. I know it's quite a commute to Rapid, but it will save on other costs. Thanks, mom. But a good first step will be getting my car back from Stevie. I've already talked to his mother. It's in the works. Do you want me to make you some popcorn before I turn in? That sounded delicious, but she didn't want to ask her mother to do anything more. No, thanks. I'm not hungry. Okay. I sure do love you, Lacey Flint. Thanks, Mom. I sure do love you too. Her mother padded away, and a minute later, Lacey heard the popcorn popper fire up. Chapter 23 Seth was about to jump into his truck and head to work when his phone rang. Though it had been years, he recognized the number. Fear gripped his stomach and twisted it into a knot. He hurried to answer. Good morning, Seth. How are you doing on this fine day? Lacey's mother was as chipper as ever. Probably nothing to be afraid of, then. I'm good, ma'am. How are you? He could practically hear her shake her head. You don't have to call me ma'am, though I appreciate the respect. Anyway, I am calling today to ask if you could go check on my Lacey. I've got to get to work, and well, she's not in very good shape. Uh. I know it's a lot to ask, she said, but I can't bear to leave her like this. Be strong. You can say the word no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Flint, but I have to go to work. He glanced at the time. He was already pushing it. Oh, that's right. I forget you're not a high school kid anymore. He'd had a job then too, but he didn't remind her of that. Okay, then. There was a weird pause, and he wondered if she had ended the call. But then she said, maybe you could pop in and check on her during your lunch break? He suppressed a groan. He did not want to do that. I'm not sure that would be a good idea. What's that, son? 
I think we have a bad connection. Thank you so much. I'll tell her that you'll be by. And then she was gone, leaving Seth to stare at his phone in wonder. What a character that woman was. He was certain that she knew he'd seen right through her ruse. She simply didn't care. And now he was expected to drive all the way across town to check on Lacey during his very short lunch break. Granted, all the way across town wasn't very far in West Hope terms, but still, he didn't want to do it. He decided he would check on Lacey by phone instead. If that upset Mrs. Flint, then so be it. He didn't want to disappoint the woman, but she didn't understand the situation. She didn't know that her daughter was a gold digger, and Seth didn't want to be the one to tell her. He hoped she could go her whole life without finding that out. You're late, Dustin said when Seth walked through the front door. I am not, Seth said while simultaneously checking his watch. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Seth knew that Dustin was trying to be funny, but he wasn't in the mood. Come on, Dustin said, we've got a service call. Good. Those were usually engaging enough so that he wouldn't spend all morning thinking about Lacey. He climbed into the truck to find Dustin staring at him. I'm hearing lots of things. Lacey's back in town? I don't want to talk about it. Dustin started the truck. Oh, but I do. Seth stared straight ahead, determined not to give him the satisfaction. Hudson said that she came to the ranch to see you? That's a diplomatic way of putting it. She literally crashed a wedding. Dustin chuckled. I'm sorry. I know she did you wrong, but that just makes me like her more. Oh, yeah, you always wanted to be a wedding crasher? No, not at all. But now that I'm thinking about it, wouldn't it be fun? He genuinely sounded excited, and Seth wanted to strangle him. No, I don't think it would be fun. Her cousin Stevie stole a bunch of food and booze. Yeah, his mirth faded. I never liked that guy, wait. She brought her cousin as her wedding crashing date? Well, yeah, he said, feeling defensive. If she was after me, despite his annoyance, those words brought a warmth to his chest that was hard to ignore, I mean, if she was there to see me, she couldn't exactly bring a real date. Sure she could have, though I suppose it's admirable that she didn't use the try-to-make-you-jealous method. Yeah, I suppose. You know what? If you're so in love with her, you marry her. Marry her? Dustin cried. That was quite a leap. Seth's cheeks grew warm. I was only talking about talking to her, but okay. He laughed at himself. He was his own biggest fan. But for the record, I am very much taken. Yeah, I know. Let's talk about her instead. Okay. Dustin rattled off all her latest accomplishments, her chart ratings, her record sales, her ticket sales. Seth mostly zoned out except for the occasional expected, wow. You're not even listening to me. Sorry. I am listening. I just don't know what most of this stuff means. It means that my woman is a hard worker and I am super proud of her. He pulled into a parking lot and turned the truck off. Then he looked at Seth. So, Lacey got divorced? That's what I hear. Seth tried to sound nonchalant. I looked it up. Seems a person can get divorced mighty quickly if they want to. Figures. He didn't know why it figured, but he didn't know what else to say. So, I'm saying, the wound could be pretty fresh. Yep. Seth got out of the truck. He didn't want to talk about, or think about, Lacey's wound. He had his own to nurse. I'm just saying, Dustin came up behind him. Be careful. I don't want you getting hurt again. Seth stopped and glared at his brother. First of all, I'm not a little kid anymore. I can take care of myself. And second, what are you talking about? There's nothing going on with me and Lacey. She showed up to talk to me or whatever, and I sent her packing. Dustin's expression made it clear that he didn't believe Seth, but he did let the matter rest. Sometimes when Dustin got going on something, he never ever stopped, so Seth counted this as a win. 
Chapter 24 Lacey was going stir-crazy. Her back was feeling so much better, it was as if she'd never fallen off a horse. Her mother had gone to work, and Lacey had already watched every movie possible. She couldn't live like this anymore. She got up with the intention of helping her mom by cleaning a little, but it quickly became clear that she wasn't quite healed enough for that. Just one sweep of the broom had her wanting more pain pills. So she lay back down and searched for info on how to heal back spasms faster. She still hadn't heard from the hospital regarding her x-ray results, but the fact that she was recovering so quickly made her confident that she'd been right. She was dealing with a muscle injury. She still didn't know what she'd done to make her back muscles so angry, but she was very sorry. The internet told her that she needed to stay hydrated, get a massage, and swim or walk. Her mother had already seen to the hydration, she had no one to massage her, and this was West Hope, South Dakota, so there was nowhere to swim. She didn't think sitting thigh deep in a creek would do much good. So, walking it was. She put on some comfy clothes and was feeling rather ambitious until she tried to tie her tennis shoes. But even this she managed after 20 minutes of slow, consistent effort. She reached for her phone and then the door. Then she realized that she had no pockets, so she set the phone by the door. She wasn't going to need it anyway. Finally, she was outside and squinting in the hot sun. But despite instantly breaking out in a sweat, she relished the freedom, the movement, the feeling of familiar ground under her feet. Her neighbor gave her a strange look, and Lacey waved. How are you doing, Mrs. Gro? Mrs. Gro did not answer until Lacey was well past her. Is that you, Lacey? Not wanting to turn around, Lacey shot her hand up into the air and waved, acting as if she had somewhere important to go. The walking was working. She felt herself loosening up and was quite proud of how smart she'd been to set off like this, and then, her head in the clouds, her right foot rolled into a hole, and she lurched sideways. Under normal circumstances, this wouldn't have been an apocalyptic event. But these were not normal circumstances. What felt like the entire right side of her body tightened up, gripping her with a pain almost as bad as the original. Keep moving, she told herself. She hadn't gotten into trouble the day before until she'd stopped moving and given her body a chance to tighten up. She pointed herself toward home, kept her chin up, and tried to keep her body straight as she walked. She forced herself to breathe through the pain, but it grew with every step. And she was still more than a half a mile from her mother's apartment. She scanned her surroundings, hoping to see someone who looked helpful, but there was no one there. She wouldn't have been so panicked if she had just brought her phone along. What had she been thinking? No pockets? So what? She could have just carried her phone in her hand like a normal person. One more step. One more step. She kept telling herself this, hoping she could trick herself into getting all the way back to the couch, one step at a time, but that only worked for about ten steps. The pain grew too strong, and she knew she wasn't going to make it. She stopped walking. She would stand here and wait for someone to drive by or walk by, and then she would wave them over. She stood on the side of the road and focused on her breathing. Wait. Breathe. Wait. Breathe. The pain continued to grow, and her body refused to comply with her order to keep standing. She bent at the waist, which took some pressure off her lower back but did little to alleviate the pain. What had she been thinking? She'd never felt so stupid. Not even in the manure pile. She looked around again, hoping to see something, anything, that would offer some encouragement. She needed something to lean on. There was a trash can, but that was kind of gross, and plus it was on wheels. She didn't need to fall down again while trying to hold onto a rolling trash can. And just beyond that, a tree. Yes. There was a good chance the tree would not roll away. She hobbled toward it and then put both hands on the bark and leaned into its stalwart goodness. I love you, tree, she mumbled. Thanks for being here. Chapter 25 Seth's heart was pounding as he dialed Lacey's mother's phone number. At about 10 o'clock, he had realized that he didn't even have Lacey's number. All he knew was the one he still knew by heart because he dialed it a zillion times in high school. 
His parents still had a landline back then, and he'd done his best to wear it out. He grew wistful. Back then. Back when it didn't matter what Lacey had been talking about, he had just loved to hear her voice. He shook the memories away and held his phone to his ear. When Fiona answered, she surprised him into silence for a moment. Uh... Mrs. Flint? Yes. This is she. Hi. This is Seth. Is Lacey there? No, she said slowly. Lacey's at home, remember? Oh. Too late he realized what had happened. I'm sorry. I thought this was still your home number. Well, it is, but I take my home number with me now. She tittered. Sorry, there's no house phone anymore. Okay. Um, could you give me Lacey's phone number then? You don't have it, she scolded. I'm afraid not. Sorry. Why on earth was he apologizing? Why would he have a married woman's phone number? Hang on. I've got to look it up. So she didn't know it either. He waited as the precious seconds of his lunch break ticked by. Finally, she said, okay, I just texted it to you. Impressed with her technological savviness, he thanked her and pressed the red button on his screen. His stomach rumbled as he waited for the text message with Lacey's number to pop up. Finally, it did, and he pressed call. It rang and rang before going to a cute voice message that sent a thrill through him. Not only was it a joy to hear her voice, but she'd used her maiden name. He'd always said that she'd always be Lacey Flint to him, but it was even cooler to hear that she was once again Lacey Flint to herself. But he didn't want to talk to her voicemail, no matter how charming her voice sounded. He wanted to talk to the real her, make sure she was okay, and then inhale his bologna and mustard sandwich. So he hung up and dialed again. And he got her perky voicemail again. Was she asleep? Did she have her phone on silent? He groaned and checked the clock again. He no longer had enough time to get to her mom's place and back again. But he was going to do it anyway. He jumped into his truck and ate while he drove. That's why he was really wishing he had something to drink when he knocked on the Flint family's front door. No one answered. So maybe she was asleep. If so, he didn't want to bother her. But her mom had asked him to check on her. Whether she truly thought that Lacey needed to be checked on was undetermined, but he had promised, so, feeling like a complete creep, he cupped his hands against the window and peered in. While he couldn't see much, what he could see was dark and still. Sure, she could have been sound asleep on the couch, but he had a feeling that the place was empty. He stood there for 30 seconds before worrying that other neighbors were watching him peep into windows and were about to call the sheriff. He turned to face this imaginary neighborhood watch. If they existed, he would ask them if they'd seen Lacey. But he saw no one. No faces in windows, no sunlight reflecting off binocular glass. And he didn't hear any sirens. He would have been able to hear them, too. The whole neighborhood was quiet and still. A dog yapped in the distance, but that was all he could hear. He turned back to the building, put his hand on the doorknob, and then hesitated. Was he crossing a line here? She wasn't his girl anymore, and this wasn't even her home. But then he remembered that this was South Dakota. Yes, he could pop into his high school sweetheart's mom's house without invitation. He tried the handle, and it turned easily in his hand. He cracked the door open and called in, Lacey? Are you in there? He held his breath and listened, but as he expected, there was no response. He called out again just in case, and then listened attentively. He jumped when the first line of Carrie Underwood's, before he cheats, chorus came blasting out at him, and it took him too long to realize that it must be a ringtone, unless someone had just decided to start blaring a clip of chic power music to scare him off. There was no way that Mrs. Flint was using, before he cheats, as a ringtone. He opened the door wider, listened to the phone ring again, and then stepped inside. The phone screen was lit up like a beacon, making it easy to find. It was on a small hallway table by the door. He called Lacey's name again while staring at the phone. She wouldn't have left without her phone, would she? A chill broke out on his skin. 
unless she had left against her will. Just how crazy was that Tony? Seth didn't actually know him. At all. Lacey, he shouted into the still apartment. Then he took out his own phone and called his friend who happened to be a sheriff's deputy. He was off duty, but he listened to Seth's rushed explanation. To his credit, he did not belittle Seth for panicking too soon. He'd gone to school with Lacey too. But neither did he sound the alarms to Seth's satisfaction. Instead, he promised to spread the word unofficially and that everyone in the department would be keeping an eye out for her. How long does she have to be missing before you do more than that? Seth snapped. Not long at all. Keep me posted. And I'll go out and look for her right now. What side of town are you on? I'm at her mother's place. Good. You take a look around that neighborhood. I'll stay on this side and ask around, see if anyone's seen her. You're right that it's weird she didn't take her phone, but I think it's far more likely that she forgot it than she's a victim of foul play. And also, I'll ask my mother to pray. He chuckled. That always works. Seth put his phone back in his pocket, wishing he could ask his own mom to pray. Mom, he whispered, if you've got any pull up there, please use it. He trotted back out to his truck and started the engine. Then he quickly texted Dustin. He was going to be taking an extended lunch break. Chapter 26 Lacey leaned with her back against the tree, the pain making her dizzy. She desperately wanted to lie down on the ground. Never had gnarly exposed roots looked so comfy. But then she was afraid no one would see her. She couldn't believe no one had walked by yet. Didn't anyone in this neighborhood have a dog? Granted, she was on a dead-end street, but still. She knew that most people in West Hope worked at least two jobs, but she had hoped to catch one going home for lunch. Two cars had gone by, and she had waved to both of them, but neither of them had touched their brakes. She was pretty sure they hadn't seen her. One of them had been looking at his phone. And so she continued to wait, trying to be patient, trying to stay calm, which was not easy. She was so angry with herself that she was feeling rather self-destructive. She tried to distract herself with daydreaming, but all mind trips led to Seth. Kissing Seth. Being held by Seth. Walking down the aisle in a white dress towards Seth. Meeting Seth's baby for the first time. These fantasies were fun, and they did pass the time, but each time she snapped back to reality, it nearly gave her whiplash. How much time had passed? The sun had barely moved in the sky. Had she been leaning on this tree for two hours? Or twenty minutes? She had no idea. Out of nowhere, a small dog came running toward her, and her whole body stiffened. She wasn't afraid of dogs, but this little thing looked rabid, and it was coming at her so fast that its ears flew out in its wake. She looked behind it, hoping to see a human giving chase, but there was no one. Hey, little guy, where did you come from? He kept coming, answering her only with a vicious bark that outweighed him by at least fifty pounds. She was grateful she'd seen him before she'd heard him, or she might have died of a heart attack. She tried to place the breed. Some kind of terrier, she thought, though it hadn't seen the clippers since Hector was a pup. It came to a sliding stop like a champion reigning horse, but its barking grew even fiercer. What's your name, bud? She tried to sound friendly. Can I call you Hector? He growled. He wore a collar, but it was dingy, and his fur was matted. I'm glad you stopped. She didn't know if talking to the dog was helping, but it made her feel a little better. I thought you were going to eat me. It would be so embarrassing to die by terrier bite, death by a thousand cuts indeed. She started humming the Taylor Swift song, and the dog stopped barking. She stopped singing to say, you're kidding. The dog started barking again. She quickly launched back into song. She only knew half the lyrics, though, so she made some up as she went along. As she sang, the dog lay down and rested his head on his paws. Unreal. Are you a Swifty? she asked. He started barking again. She started singing again but when she got to the line about sharing a small town with her lost love, her throat grew too thick to keep going. Hector started barking again. 
Oh, will you just give me a minute, she screeched. I have a broken heart, okay? She did not expect sympathy from the mangy mutt, and she didn't get it. Of course not. Nobody named Hector was big on compassion. She caught her breath and opened her mouth to sing again. It was better than the barking. But this time she chose a happier song. Halfway through the first verse, Hector spun around and headed back the way he'd come. He was gone so quickly that she wondered if he'd been a hallucination. She held her breath and listened, wondering if someone had called him, but she didn't hear anyone. Maybe Hector didn't like snow on the beach. If so, he'd never been a true Swifty at all. She tipped her head back against the tree, relishing the quiet, thankful she didn't have to sing anymore or worry about being murdered by a terrier named Hector. She heard the vehicle approaching before she saw it, and she prayed the sound wasn't coming from a nearby street or her imagination. Then she saw it, and she lifted her hand to wave way before anyone could have seen her. She was mid-wave when she realized that she was waving to Seth's truck. Relief flooded through her. My hero. Just like the old days. He had saved her time and time again. When she decided to go off-roading with her ten-year-old Honda Civic. When she'd been stupid enough to try shotgunning beer and made herself too sick to function. When she'd gone on a date with someone else to make Seth jealous, and that someone else had turned out to be a real jerk. Seth Honeywood always showed up. So why had she left him? When he accelerated, she thought maybe he was tired of playing the hero part, but then he yanked his truck to the side of the road, jumped out, and ran toward her. What's wrong? This time, when he grabbed her, she didn't protest. She was too exhausted, too grateful, too in love. She wrapped her arms around his neck and thanked him over and over. He held her there for a moment, letting her cry, before saying again, what's wrong? She felt his impatience, and she pulled back a little, but she didn't let go. I'm okay. She sniffed. Sorry. I just... How was she supposed to explain her predicament while maintaining any dignity at all? She decided that she couldn't and just disgorged the truth, I thought I was better, but I'm an idiot, and I'm not all better, and I thought a walk would cure me faster, and I was wrong. Actually, I don't know if I was wrong because I was okay, until I accidentally stepped in a hole, and now I can't walk and I was scared I was going to have to live beside this tree for the rest of my life, and I'm so embarrassed? And a terrier named Hector tried to murder me, and I had to sing it Taylor Swift songs. She sucked in some air. Seth was staring at her, and his eyes were dancing, she was transported back through time. This was the look. The one he'd given her back in seventh grade, then again on their first date, then again when he saw her in her first prom dress, then again when he'd proposed and she'd said yes, the look. And there was only one way to respond to that look. She grabbed the front of his shirt with both hands, pulled him into her, and kissed him like her life depended on it. And he kissed her back. Though her lips were wet with her tears, he kissed her with a passion she hadn't felt in years, and then he pulled away, letting go of her completely. She wobbled a bit as pain shot through her bottom. She reached back for the tree, which wasn't where she thought it would be, and she nearly toppled over backward. But then he caught her. To anyone passing by, it would look like they'd been dancing, and he'd dipped her for the grand finish, but his expression was hard. The look was gone. There was no sparkle in his eye. There was nothing. Let's get you into the truck. She tried to walk on her own and hated how much she needed his help. Sorry, she said. He didn't respond. He opened the truck door for her and helped her into the seat. Chapter 27 Seth couldn't believe he had kissed her. His whole body was on fire. He tried to ignore the burning, but it wasn't easy. He grabbed his phone from the seat and called the deputy, explained that he'd found her, and thanked him for the help. Also, thank your mom for me. He promised that he would, and they ended the call. You called the cops? Lacey sounded horrified. He dropped his phone and glared at her. It's the 21st century. Who goes somewhere without a phone? I imagine lots of people do, she spat back. What 25-year-old goes somewhere without a phone? She snapped her mouth shut and turned to look out the window. He started the truck. 
You scared me half to death. I thought Tony had kidnapped you. She giggled, which made him even angrier. Fine, next time I won't care. Next time I won't even check on you. Sorry, she said after an awkward silence. It's just funny that you thought Tony could snatch me. I can totally kick his butt. But you're right that he could have hired someone else to snatch me. But that's not his style. He didn't want to know what Tony's style was. If he changes his mind, he will try to buy me back, not kidnap me. This made sense. Why wouldn't Tony think that would work? He'd been able to buy her the first time. Seth pulled into her driveway. I suppose you need help into the house? She turned and glared at him. You know what? No, I don't. In fact, please don't touch me. With each word, she sounded less angry, and more tired. The fatigue riding her voice hurt him far more than the anger had. And don't contact me again. Thank you for rescuing me. Today and all the times before that. But I really don't want to be rescued by you again. I can take care of myself, and I need to remember that. So I'm going to get myself into the house. It will take me a while, but I'm going to do it. Please drive away. She put her hand on the door handle and stared out through the windshield. I'm so, so sorry, Seth. That's what I came to the wedding to tell you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't marry you. I'm sorry that I chose money over you. It was a horrible mistake. But I never stopped loving you, and I could tell from that kiss that you still love me too. But that's okay. I'm done. I'm officially giving up. If you can't forgive me, then you're not the man I thought you were. She sighed. Goodbye, Seth Honeywood. She opened the door and slid out with a swiftness that surprised him. It had to have hurt. She slammed the door shut without turning around and then turned to the house. He watched her take a single step and then stand there shaking. He couldn't stand to watch this. No, he didn't want to forgive her. No, he didn't want to give her a second chance. But he couldn't let her suffer like this. He had to help. He got out of the truck and started toward her, but she turned to him with fury in her eyes. I wasn't kidding, she said firmly. I'm not playing. She held her arm out and pointed at the road. Her arm shook with the pain. Please, go. I never want to see you again. I need to start working on getting over you. He didn't want to leave. It couldn't end like this. He needed to lighten the moment. What would Dustin do? He would crack a joke. Seth tried to think of a joke, but his mind was blank, and if he said, knock, knock, he thought she might combust right there in front of him. Why did you sing Taylor Swift songs to a dog? He gave her his most charming smile, or he tried to, anyway. If his question softened her heart at all, she didn't let it show. Instead, she looked down and took another small step. He moved to help her, and she held up one hand. Please, Seth. I'm begging you. Just go. He couldn't argue with that. He watched her for another few seconds, but he felt like he was trespassing, like he was spying on someone's private moment. No, it was worse than that, even. He was spying on a stranger's private moment. And that stranger didn't want him there. So, with his heart throbbing, he climbed back into his truck. And then he made himself drive away before she'd reached the front door. Chapter 28 Lacey heard the front door creak open and hoped it was her mother. Hi, honey, she called out. Lacey's heart rate relaxed. She hadn't been expecting Seth to show up again, but she'd been fearing it. He wasn't one to let things stay broken. Any minute now, he was going to try to apologize, and she truly didn't want to hear it. She was exhausted. She had never really loved Tony, but his betrayal still hurt. And then she'd been rejected by Seth. It was all too much. She was a strong woman. She wanted to stay single for a while. Maybe forever. If fate dropped some perfect man in her lap a few years from now, maybe she'd reconsider, but until then. 
How did your day? Her mother stopped abruptly, staring down at her. Honey, you don't look so good. She bent and placed the back of her hand on Lacey's forehead. Lacey laughed lightly and pushed it away. She knew it was motherly instinct to check, but she didn't have a fever. I'm fine. It is so very obvious that you are not fine. No, I really am. But I was feeling better, and so I think I might have tried to do too much. She knew she had tried to do too much, but she was not going to admit to her mother that she'd gone for an extended walk become best friends with a tree, serenaded a feral four-legged Swifty, and then had yet another fight with Seth. Honey, you need to rest. You start work next. I know that now. I'm sorry. Boy, was she. She had never been so sorry. Her mom sat and stared at her. Something else is going on. You had better tell me. She pressed her lips into a thin line and stared at her. She was going to wait just like that until Lacey gave her something substantial. Lacey sighed. Oh, mom, please relax. Go get changed into something comfy. Get some food. I'm fine. Stop saying you're fine when you're not. She narrowed her eyes. If I change and get some food, will you tell me what's going on? Sure. She didn't want to argue, and that would give her enough time to come up with a simple explanation. She wouldn't lie to her mother, but she certainly didn't need to tell her the whole truth. Her mother was a rational woman, she might not even believe the whole truth. Yet, when her mom handed her a bowl of reheated pot roast, the truth came pouring out of Lacey. I kissed him, mom. When she didn't immediately respond, Lacey clarified. I kissed Seth. Her mom guffawed. Well, of course you kissed Seth. Who else would you kiss? And now I know for sure that it's really over. She knew this would hurt her mother almost as much as it hurt her, so she couldn't bear to look at her. I'm sorry. He didn't kiss you back? Oh no. He did. Her mother fell silent, forcing Lacey to check to make sure she was still breathing. I don't understand. He still loves me. I could feel it. But he's choosing to stay angry. Even though I've explained why I did what I did, even though I apologized, even though I've made it clear that I still love him, he's still choosing anger. And I don't have room for that right now. Her mother gasped, forcing Lacey to look at her again. What was that for? Well, aren't we all high and mighty? What? Her mother never spoke to her like that. Lacey, the man proposed to you. You agreed to marry him. And then you just ran off with some jerk in a suit. A man like Seth isn't just going to get over that. I'm not asking him to just get over it. But it's been three years. And I've apologized. What else can I do? You can be patient with him. You can give him time. You can be his friend while he recovers. I don't have time for that. Well. You don't have room and you don't have time. Her mother set her bowl down on the coffee table with a little too much force, and a small, mushy potato popped out, rolled off the table, and went splat on the floor. You two are absolute stubborn fools. Lacey was speechless. She couldn't believe her mother was taking this position. She had always been on Lacey's side, even when Lacey's side was ridiculous. Like the time she'd gotten a detention for shooting spitballs through a straw. Her mother had somehow negotiated Lacey out of that one, leaving her on spitball probation, whatever that was, for the remainder of the school year. But now. Now her mother was betraying her. I'm not a fool. You're right. You're going to sacrifice your happiness for your pride. And so is he. I hope that pride keeps you both warm at night and gives you lots of children. She stood up. I'm going to bed. Completely aghast, Lacey watched her mother go. Normally, she considered her mom to be a wise woman. A little clucky, but wise, nonetheless. But not this time. This time, her mom was wrong. Her mother had come from a generation where women put up with junk because it was their job to do so. Lacey was from a different generation, a generation where women stood up for themselves. 
Thank goodness. Chapter 29 The front door of the public water works building hadn't even shut behind Seth before Dustin was chiding him. So you decided to show up for work today? Yep. Just like I show up every other day. Dustin came closer. So what happened yesterday? I didn't want to talk about it then, and I don't want to talk about it now. Dustin's teasing smile faded a bit. Whoa, man, you look tired. Did you get any sleep? No, as a matter of fact, he hadn't. Guilt had kept him up all night. Someone called for Dustin, and he scurried off to fix something. Seth made himself busy, trying not to think about Lacey, trying not to think about anything except work. Three cups of coffee later, it was finally his lunch break. He didn't dare sit down for fear of falling asleep, so he leaned against his truck and unwrapped his sandwich. Dustin appeared out of nowhere and dropped his tailgate. He sat on it and patted the metal beside him. Come on, bro. Take a load off. I'm good. Seth took another bite of his sandwich. Dustin laughed, and it was clear that Seth was the butt of the joke, but he didn't know what the joke was. What? He reached into Dustin's cooler and stole a Coke. Dustin shook his head, staring off in the distance. Nothing, man. I just always thought Burke was the stubborn one. Didn't know you had it in you. Yes, Seth knew he was being stubborn, but how did Dustin know that? He hadn't told Dustin anything lately. He hadn't told anyone anything. But he didn't like being compared to Burke. Burke could be a real jerk. Seth was the nice one. Always had been. What are you talking about? Dustin spared him a quick glance before turning his attention to his chip bag. Mindy wants me to move to Nashville. What? The abrupt change of topic gave him whiplash. Yeah, he munched on chips, staring off into the distance again. What are you going to do? I was thinking that I don't want to go, but I don't want to act like a stubborn mule. Dustin gave him a pointed look. Oh, so we're not really talking about you here, are we? No, we are. She really does want me to move. And I think I'm going to, even though I don't want to. Again, I think you are giving me advice in disguise. Dustin faked dramatic disgust. Don't be such a narcissist. Not everything is about you, Seth. You are nowhere near as funny as you think you are. I am hilarious, and you've always thought so until you got too busy with your self-sabotage to laugh. I am not self-sabotaging. If anything, I am self-preserving. Yeah, like one of those people that freezes themselves for eternity? That kind of preservation? I hear they are really happy in their ice chests. Seth was annoyed and angry, but he was also concerned about Dustin's life. Are you really going to go? I think I really am. Where will you work? I think they have water in Tennessee. Despite himself, Seth couldn't help but laugh. Fair enough. Honestly, I don't think I'll need to work. Not to brag or anything, but my girlfriend's kind of rich, and she lets me hang around while she writes songs. Sometimes she lets me contribute a word or two so that I won't feel like such a bum. Dustin was being overly humble. Seth knew that Dustin had contributed far more than a word or two to Mindy's new album. Good for you. He joined Dustin in staring at the horizon. I can't imagine leaving this place. You don't have to. The love of your life is right here. The words pierced him like a blade, and it took him a few seconds to recover. Before you lecture me anymore, you should know that I laid awake all night feeling guilty, and I decided that I will go apologize to her after work today. What do you have to apologize for? Now Dustin sounded defensive on his behalf. It was touching. I've kind of been a jerk. I mean, I haven't actually been mean to her, I don't think. If I had, her mother would be after me. But I haven't been my usual kind self either. And while I do have an excuse to be a jerk to her, if I'm not the nice guy, then who am I? Kindness is really the only thing I've got going for me. That's not true. You're smart, and you've got a good sense of humor. I'm not funny. You're a little funny, 
but what I meant was that you have the good sense of humor to laugh at my jokes. Dustin laughed. And though I'm no expert, I think you're probably pretty good looking. I mean, you look like me. He elbowed him in the ribs. But seriously, dad gave us good genes. Seth wasn't a good judge of men's attractiveness either, but their mom had always told them what a looker their dad was, and Seth believed his mother. They're still going to let me work here with you gone, right? Dustin laughed brightly. See? You can be funny sometimes. Of course they are, as long as you don't keep taking extended lunch breaks. But don't go saying anything yet. Nothing is official, and I haven't told anyone anything yet. Not even Hudson? Not even Hudson. This all sort of just happened. I'm still processing. But I can tell you one thing. I'm not going to let her go because of geography. That makes sense. Seth slapped his brother on the back. Good for you, man. I'm happy for you. She seems great. He laughed. I can't believe she picked you, but good for you. Dustin laughed as well. I can't believe she picked me either, but I'm not going to argue with her. He handed Seth the rest of his chips. I sense that you're not really in a place to take advice, no matter how sound it is. But Lacey is a real catch, and she's not going to wait around forever waiting for you to forgive her. Would you forgive her? Seth snapped. Dustin shrugged. It's hard to say. I've never been in your shoes. But I don't think I would bite off my nose to spite my face. Their father had always used that expression. Seth had hated it back then, and he didn't love it now. That's not what I'm doing, and it's not that I can't forgive her. I had pretty much forgiven her before she showed up. But how can I spend the rest of my life with someone I can't trust? I'll always be looking over my shoulder, always be wondering if she'll be home when I get there. And if I can't spend the rest of my life with her, then why mess with her at all? I should be looking for someone else, someone I can trust. Dustin hopped off the tailgate. I think we make mistakes. All of us. That doesn't mean that we're not trustworthy. He shrugged. Burn you once, maybe that's a mistake. Burn you twice, and I'll eat my words. But I don't think she'll burn you a second time. Anyway, that's my two cents. I'll send you the bill. He laughed at his own joke and walked off leaving Seth to polish off his chips and ponder his words. The chips were delicious. His words were a little harder to swallow. Chapter 30 By Tuesday afternoon Lacey was feeling much better. She was sitting up, watching TV, and bored out of her mind, but she didn't quite dare take another walk. At one o'clock, the hospital called and relayed that her x-rays showed no skeletal damage. This news was a relief, but didn't surprise her. At two o'clock someone knocked on the door, and once again Lacey feared it was Seth. But it wasn't. It was Stevie and Kelly. Stevie held his arm out toward her, her key chain dangling off the end of one fingertip. He looked pleased as punch. We filled the tank for you. Oh, gee thanks. She let her sarcasm be thick. She didn't care if she offended him. She couldn't believe he'd absconded with her car. It was the least I could do. Thanks for the loan. It's not a loan when you steal something. Hey, he cried defensively. I tried to ask permission, but you were asleep. She didn't know if she'd been asleep at the time or knocked unconscious, but it was a moot point by now. Well, thanks for bringing it back, I guess. Yeah, my mom made me. He laughed. My mom is scared of your mom. He laughed again. Lacey wasn't amused. Stevie put his arm around Kelly's significant waist and smiled brightly. I sure am glad you introduced me to wedding crashing. It couldn't have worked out better for me. I'm so glad. Now Lacey didn't know if she was being sarcastic or not. She really was glad he was happy. Kelly wouldn't meet her eyes, and Lacey felt bad. Sure, they'd shared some embarrassing moments, but they'd shared them together, so that meant neither of them should be embarrassed by the other, right? Hey, Kelly. You look great in real clothes. Kelly gave her a small smile. 
Thanks. And I'm sorry for thinking you were Tonia. No need to apologize. I could have set you straight right off the bat, but I chose not to. I'm probably the one who should apologize. You don't need to either. And please tell the Honeywoods that I'm sorry about the four-wheeler. Who was this woman? The woman before her was soft-spoken, practically demure. What happened to the wild child with the cowbell voice? She realized she was staring at Kelly and pulled her eyes away. Isn't she great? Stevie was obviously in love, and a pang of jealousy stabbed Lacey's chest. She is great. Though she is a different kind of great than I thought. Kelly giggled quietly, and her eyes lifted to meet Lacey's. That's why I don't drink often. Turns out I'm a bit more adventurous when I'm under the influence. Adventurous didn't seem to be a strong enough word. Well, I'm very happy for both of you. But her happiness didn't mean she was feeling social. She jingled the keys in her hand. Thanks for bringing the car back, but I have to get back to. She tipped her head back to suggest there was something of burning importance in the home behind her. Yes, yes, of course. Stevie stepped back. We've got to get going too. We have to get Kelly to the airport. Oh, that was right. Kelly lived in Massachusetts. How was that going to work? I've given my notice, Stevie said excitedly, and I'll be joining her soon. Oh, wow. His mother was going to have a fit. Well, have a nice flight. Lacey shut the door and returned to her couch, her throat sick with a grief she didn't really understand. Minutes later, she got up to explore the freezer and found a tub of ice cream that was only missing one small scoop. It was low carb, but she hoped she wouldn't notice. She returned to the couch, restarted the new Top Gun movie, and dug in. Nope, tasted like carbs to her. She ate until she felt sick and then dozed off while Rooster and Maverick were trying to escape from the unnamed enemy country. When her mother got home a little after five, she startled Lacey awake. There hadn't been much ice cream left, but when Lacey sat up quickly, the soggy cardboard container tipped over and spilled it on her shirt. It felt like a lot as it soaked through the material and iced her skin. Her mother raised an eyebrow. Did I say you could polish off my rebel? No, Lacey said while trying to rub the rest of the ice cream into her shirt so it wouldn't drip onto her mother's couch. But I did feel rebellious while doing so. Her mother laughed brightly, which made Lacey feel good. She got up to go change her shirt, and her mother stared at it with reproach in her eyes. Don't judge me, Lacey said playfully. I've been through a lot. I wasn't judging. When you were a toddler, you fell into the ice cream cake. I didn't realize I was going to get a repeat performance. I fell into an ice cream cake? How did I do that? It was your birthday party. I went into the kitchen to get a knife, and you decided to dance on the table. Lacey tried to smother a grin. Was it weird to be proud of something she'd done as a child? And then the weirdest impulse gripped her, and it wiped the smile off her face. She wanted to tell Seth that story. Did he know that she'd danced on the table when she was two? She couldn't remember knowing that let alone sharing it with someone, so she didn't think he knew. And she was practically desperate to tell him. But she couldn't. Because he wasn't her friend. Someone knocked on the door. Her mother didn't look pleased by this development. Are you expecting someone? She hated that she hoped it was Seth. I'm not. Can you get it? She started toward the bedroom where she hoped to find a clean shirt. Can I get it? No. It's not for me. She waved at the shirt. You decided to roll around in my ice cream. You answer the door. She scurried away before Lacey could argue. Grudgingly, Lacey headed to the door, and someone knocked again before she got there. A chill danced over her skin. It wasn't Seth, he wouldn't have knocked again so soon, and she had a bad feeling about who it was. She considered not opening the door at all. She could hide under the table like they used to do when her mom's makeup peddling friend came calling. They knocked again, and her irritation empowered her. She ripped the door open to see, no one there. Only a stack of impeccably wrapped gifts. And she knew exactly where they'd come from. 
she knew exactly what this meant. What she didn't know was whether Tony was physically there. Or had he sent a delivery person. She didn't want to look, but she did anyway. She stepped to the doorway and looked out, left, then right, and then he was there, right in front of her. Hi, baby doll. She cringed. She'd hated it when he called her that, but now that she'd had a few months off, she really hated it. She looked down at the gifts, which were wrapped in color coordinated paper and ribbon. More than ten of them stacked in a little pyramid. The sight of them made her feel nauseous. He hadn't wrapped these. He probably hadn't even picked them out. I don't want these. Sure you do. How had she ever lived with this man? No, I really don't. I realized that today is the anniversary of our very first date, and so I really wanted to see you. There was a time when she would have found this charming. Now, the veneer was so thin that she could see the mold underneath. Their first date had been in May. It wasn't May. Aren't you going to invite me in? I wasn't planning on it. Tony, what do you want? I don't want these gifts. How can you say that before you unwrap them? He picked up one of the smaller boxes and shook it by his ear, trying to look playful. He was never truly playful. I guarantee you want this one. He held it out toward her, and she didn't even look at it. I'll give you a hint. It's a big thing in a little package. When she didn't react, he added, rhymes with booze. Please, go. I'm not your wife anymore. And that was your doing. His smile slid away. I know, baby doll, and that's why I'm here. We need to talk. Her laughter surprised her. And the sharpness of it surprised her even more. No, we don't. She started to shut the door, but he stuck his foot out to stop it. Please, just two minutes. She didn't want to give him any minutes, but she also wanted him to go away, and she thought this was the easiest way. Go ahead. Inside? She shook her head. The clock's running. Only a year into their marriage, he had started giving her disgusted looks, usually when he thought she couldn't see him. He gave her one of those now. So whatever this was, it wasn't truly regret. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Please come back. Let me make it up to you. No, she said shortly. Don't you want to know how I'll make it up to you? No. He sighed. Cruises. Vacations. Let's go to Italy. Right? You wanted to go to Italy. We can move if you want. Anywhere in the city or even the suburbs. You can pick out the house. We can finally start that family you want. The fact that he offered offspring after he offered Italy told her that he didn't know her at all. She was pretty sure she had never, ever mentioned Italy. She might have said she wanted to go to the Olive Garden, but they had one of those in Chicago. I don't know how to make this any clearer. My answer is no. No to all of it. Please leave me alone. She started to shut the door again, and this time he stopped it with his body, which brought him way too close to her. Startled, she stepped back, and he tried to push his way inside. She pushed back, though, which put them nose to nose on the threshold. Go away, she said through gritted teeth, or I'll call the. Don't be stupid, Lacey, he hissed. He looked up at the door frame. Are you really going to choose this? You're going to choose nothing over having everything? I know you, Lacey. I know that's not what you want. You might have known me once, but I've changed. You don't have to explain yourself to him, child, her mother said from behind her. Just hearing her voice emboldened her, and Lacey stood up straighter and raised her chin. And I'm calling the sheriff right now, her mother added. I'm not doing anything illegal. His words dripped with condescension. I don't care, Lacey said slowly, making each word a sentence of its own. Is he bothering you? Lacey's heart leapt at the sound of Seth's voice. And it wasn't his normal voice either. It was deeper, stronger. He sounded angry. He sounded as if he was ready to grab Tony by the belt and chuck him out into the street. This was entirely unlike Seth. 
Hi, Seth, she said, her tone saccharine sweet. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, he is bothering me, but it's okay. He was just leaving. Chapter 31 All the way up the walk, Seth tried to convince himself that the tiny man in front of Lacey wasn't her ex-husband. Seth had only seen him once or twice, and it had been a long time. But when Seth made his presence known, the man turned to sneer at him, and his face had the same pointy little nose that Lacey had married. It was like a small weapon in the middle of his face, like someone had sharpened it. He wanted to grab the man by the back of his pants and, yet, him out into the road. He'd thrown hay bales that weighed more than this guy. Lacey said that Tony was leaving, and Seth waited for him to move. When he didn't, Seth stepped closer. This doesn't concern you, Bumpkin. He gave Lacey a sleazy smile. Who is this guy? Seth Honeywood, he said evenly and waited for it to register. Tony looked at him again. You say your name as if it's supposed to mean something to me. Again he turned to Lacey, but this time he stepped back at least. Come on, baby doll. I don't have time for this. I'll send someone for your things. Get in the car. Seth started toward him then, not knowing what he was going to do, but knowing that he was going to do something, and it was going to get him in trouble, but Lacey stepped between them. Get out of my sight, Tony. I'm not playing. Tony looked over her shoulder at Seth and then gave her a disgusted look. This offer is only good for the next 10 seconds, and then it's gone. Think about what you're throwing away. And get these gifts off my mother's steps. He motioned to the black car parked by the side of the road, and someone leapt out. Somehow, the hired help could read his boss's mind and knew that such a hand signal meant to retrieve the packages. While he did so, Tony got himself into his car. Seth was tempted to help the poor sap with the gifts, but he didn't want to get close to the car, nor did he want to leave Lacey unguarded. Come on in. Lacey went inside, and Seth followed. Oh good, Mrs. Flint said. I was tempted to interfere, but I wanted you two kids to know that you handled it on your own. I handled it, Mom. Good. I've got to run to the store and get, some, guacamole. She grabbed her purse from its hook and flew out the front door, leaving them alone. She's on a low-carb diet, Lacey said, trying to explain away her mom's weirdness. Did he forget my name, or did you never tell him it? Lacey crossed her arms in front of her chest and took a step back. Why would I tell him about you, Seth? He was my husband. Husbands don't want to hear about their wife's first love. First love. That's all he was? Not soulmate. Not only love. Just first love. Just high school sweetheart. His stomach churned. Anyway, I came over here to say I was sorry. He didn't feel so sorry anymore. I know I was kind of hard on you yesterday, and I get that we need to part ways, but I wanted to be able to part on friendly terms at least. Friendly, she repeated dryly. Yeah, friendly. I'm not mad at you, Lacey, and I don't want you to be mad at me. It took her a long time to respond. I have no interest in being friends with you. Okay, then. I can see I've wasted my time here. He turned to storm off, but his curiosity stopped him. Not that it's any of my business, but what was he doing here? That's a good question, she said readily. He said he came to take me back, but that is so very strange that it can't be true. There was something else going on, but I haven't figured it out yet. Seth turned to look at her. But I will. Eventually. Maybe you shouldn't waste your energy on that. Good point. But still, I want to know. For someone who didn't want to be friendly, her tone was awfully friendly. Is it that unbelievable that he would realize his mistake? Maybe he loves you. Maybe he does want you back. She shook her head. He left me for someone better. Maybe she dumped him. But that still doesn't sound like him. He doesn't admit when he's wrong. If she dumped him, he would just find someone else, someone better than both of us. There is no one better than you, Lacey. Her eyes jumped to meet his. 
That is sweet of you to say. Their eyes locked, and for a moment he thought about kissing her again. Maybe they could just make it all go away. Maybe she was trustworthy. Maybe he was being an idiot. Then he remembered that she was only interested in him because she thought he had income from the ranch. She didn't know that he had no money at all. And if she did, she would lose interest in a hot second, just like she had last time. I should go. Yeah, she opened the door for him, and the gifts in the black car were gone. What do you think was in the boxes, he asked. A cruise. Car keys. Jewelry. Perfume. She shrugged. Don't know. He stopped on the steps and turned to her. And you're really not going to miss all that? She shook her head as she sucked in her bottom lip. Honestly? Yeah, maybe a little. But all those riches were not worth the price. What was the price, he asked before he could stop himself. The pain of living with someone who hates you. The words floated out to him like the final chord of a sad song. Oh. Okay, then. He didn't know what else to say, so he walked away, but every step he took he questioned whether he should turn around. Chapter 32 Completely healed and raring to go, Lacey packed her meager belongings into her old car and then hugged her mom. Goodbye. You sure you don't want to stay? Paying rent is an awful waste of money. I know, but it will be fun having roommates. Maybe I'll meet Mr. Wright. Her mother gave her a sardonic look that said, you already know him, and Lacey regretted saying anything. I'll come visit all the time. I just want to be closer to my new job. That wasn't entirely true. She didn't necessarily want to live in Rapid. She just didn't want to live in West Hope. It was too close. There were too many memories. You can always retire and move to the city with me. Her mother laughed as if that were ridiculous. I'll retire when I'm dead. Lacey patted her mother's hand. I hope you retire long before then. Okay, I've got to get going. She climbed into the car and backed out of the drive. She just pulled into a gas station when her phone rang. She didn't recognize the number, but it was a Chicago number, which made her curious enough to answer. This is Chantel Wisley. Lacey's stomach somersaulted. She knew that name. Tony's ex. The woman was crazy, violent even. He'd had to get a restraining order and everything. Okay, Lacey said tentatively. I don't know what Tony told you about me, she paused to let Lacey fill her in, but Lacey thought it wise not to. Chantel laughed. So it's like I thought. Well, anyway, I don't know if you know this, but you and I know some of the same people. Not anymore. Okay. She still didn't know where this was going, which was making her exceedingly uncomfortable. I know, sorry, I can only imagine what you're thinking. Sorry, I'll get to the point. She inhaled sharply. Everyone is gossiping about you, and everyone thinks you're stupid. I don't know you, but I know enough to know that you're not stupid. Nope. Not stupid. Only missed valedictorian by one hundredth of a point. Why do they think I'm stupid? Rumor is that you let him get away with everything. Divorcing that snake should have made you a rich woman, Lacey. Oh, was that all? Lacey sighed in irritation. We had a prenup. I know you did. Chantel's voice took on a mischievous tone. And do you know that any lawyer worth her salt could have had that voided? No, she didn't know that. It's a little late now. No, it's not. I'm an attorney. I'll represent you for free. We will sue the pants off him. A wave of nausea drove through Lacey's stomach. That's okay. I don't need to do that. Are you serious? Her shock was nearly palpable. Lacey didn't hesitate. Yeah. He did not disclose the truth about his finances. Not when the prenup was drawn up, that's enough to get it voided, and not when you went to divorce court. What? What did that mean? Was he even richer than he let on? Was that even possible? It's true. He is in hock up to his eyeballs. That's why I left him. 
I didn't want to live with that debt hanging over my head. And all the lying, anyway, sorry, this isn't about me. You left him? That was not the story Lacey had been told. Chantel laughed. You bet your booty I did. Anyway, your prenup should have been voided. You are due some of his assets. He would have to sell everything he has to pay you what he owes you. He'd lose his company. It might even bankrupt him. This was too much info too fast. Wait, he's broke? Well, no, not exactly. He has his company, which is profitable, but he owes so much money that he's upside down. So, yeah, in a way, I guess he's broke. A thin peal of laughter escaped Lacey, and she slapped a hand over her mouth too late to stop it. It didn't seem appropriate to laugh, but she was so shocked, she didn't know what else to do. Wait, does he know that you were going to contact me? I don't know, why? Because a few days ago, he came to my mother's house in South Dakota, and You're from South Dakota, she cried, as if Lacey had told her she was from Pluto. Good grief, girl. Yes. Anyway, he begged me to come back. To remarry him? He didn't use those words, but that was the gist of it, I think. Oh, so then, he does know, she said conspiratorially. Unless of course, he actually wanted you back. No offense. None taken, she said quickly. And no, there was definitely something suspicious going on. Yeah, I probably had too much wine and told too many people. But that won't hurt our chances in court. He lied. He can't unring that bell. I'm sorry, but I don't want to go to court. Oh, well, we might be able to settle outside of court. I can push for that without letting them know I'm pushing. He'll probably be glad to have less publicity for. No, I mean that I want nothing to do with any of this. Sorry. Lacey, she said gravely, after a long pause. There's a lot of money on the table here. I know, she said softly. Thank you for the offer, but I'm good. She said, goodbye, and ended the call. Then she looked at her odometer. Her old girl was gaining on the 200,000 mile mark. Then she looked in her wallet. She wasn't even going to be able to fill the tank. Had she made a horrible mistake? Her brain told her that maybe she had, but her gut told her that she had narrowly escaped a nightmare. She got out of the car, squirted $18 into the gas tank, and then got back on the road. She rolled the windows down and sang along with Taylor Swift at the top of her lungs, completely at peace, completely fearless, and completely free for the first time in a very long time. Chapter 33 Chase drove up the long drive that led to the Bannon Ranch. A herding dog ran down the driveway to greet him, then spun around to escort him the rest of the way to the yard. Lewis, who'd been lying on the seat beside him, sat up and whined at the window. Lewis wasn't Chase's dog, but Hudson and Evelyn had both been working, so Chase had asked him if he wanted to go for a ride. Lewis was one of the many reasons Chase was finding it hard to think about leaving the ranch. He parked the truck and slid out to find Liam Bannon striding toward him. Liam offered him a hand, and Chase shook it. Good to see you, Honeywood. What brings you around? Was looking for Holden. Can't seem to get him to answer his phone. Chase hated leaving voicemails, so it wasn't entirely Holden's fault. I can hardly get him to carry a phone. Let me see if I can find out where he is for you. Liam looked at Lewis in the cab. You can let him out. He can't hurt nothing around here. Lewis looked at Chase for permission, which Chase granted with a nod, and Lewis leapt out of the truck as if his legs weren't only six inches long. Chase silently laughed at the gomp and then shut the door behind him. He walked to the edge of the corral and watched the men, and one woman, work the horses. The Bannons had some beautiful animals. They were good to their horses here. Lewis lay by Chase's boots and fell asleep while Chase continued to watch. Thirty minutes later someone slapped him on the back. What's up? Holden asked. He leaned on the panel beside Chase. Busy day? No busier than any other, I guess. What's up? Chase understood his impatience. 
Chase never just showed up here. Holden probably thought something was wrong. He was right. Just for the sake of discussion, are the Bannons in need of any good horses? Holden frowned. You would need to talk to the equine manager. I don't know her. I know you. Let's start there. Holden didn't answer for a long time. They could always use some good horses, but I think the right answer depends on the real reason you're asking. Chase didn't want to get into that. You said they. Yeah, I'm not a Bannon. Eh, uh, you're sort of an honorary Bannon, aren't you? My friend, I am a glorified Wrangler, no matter what they say. They're nice folks, but I am not blood. Chase knew the Bannons would argue with that sentiment, but he didn't. And I'm getting tired. I can't imagine. Wrangling is hard work. Yes, it is. But this is my home. He separated his hands and held them up empty. Nowhere else I want to be. He spoke slowly, thoughtfully, sounding much older than he was. So, I keep on wrangling. Chase sighed. He was in a different situation, but he could relate. They each had a home where they didn't really fit. So, why are you trying to sell horses? I don't know if I am. Yet. But if it comes to that, I'm going to lose my mind just selling them off. I would need to know where they were going if I have any hope of keeping my sanity intact. So you want them to come here? I don't know yet. But it seemed like a possibility. Holden nodded. It is a possibility, especially if I put in a word. It would be up to Blade. She really does make the calls, but she's reasonable. More reasonable than her husband. Holden laughed. I don't need charity, though. I would want them to be put to use. They won't be happy if they're just boarded here. Holden nodded, understanding. No being should live like that. Holden looked at him out of the corner of his eye. Money trouble? Chase shook his head and then stopped. Maybe it did qualify as money trouble, though that's not what it felt like. It's complicated. It's never as complicated as we make it. Fair enough. Chase sighed. He didn't feel like explaining. They stood there silently for a long time. Holden was in no hurry to move on, and he did nothing to pressure Chase to talk. He seemed content to stand there till morning. I should go, Chase finally said. Hudson would be home soon and wonder where his dog was. But thanks for listening. Holden chuckled. Didn't hear much, but I did listen. Chase was grateful. He started toward the truck. You didn't ask for advice, Holden said from behind him. Chase stopped walking. But don't give up your horses. Chase turned back, shaking his head. I don't think I can stay where I'm at. Holden nodded, unsurprised by this admission. That doesn't mean you have to give up your horses. Chase thanked him again and gave Lewis a boost. Those six-inch-long legs weren't so flashy when it was time to jump back into the truck. Chase climbed in after him, buckled up, and started the engine. He caught Holden's eye one more time before driving away. Maybe he should have told him more. Maybe he should have explained. Holden could have helped. Oh well, there would probably be another chance for that. Chase drove back to the ranch, trying to figure out if Holden had been right. Was there a way to keep the horses? He didn't see how. He couldn't ask Hudson and Olivia to give up what they'd built. It stressed them out something fierce, but he could tell that they loved it. And while he didn't care much about money, he knew that some people did, and if it made his family happy to have a way to earn more of it, then he wouldn't stand in the way of that. He had to go. And that wasn't the problem. He could go tonight and be just fine wherever he landed, as long as he landed somewhere with no people. The problem was the horses, and they were a big problem. He couldn't leave them behind, and he couldn't afford to take them with him. He looked down at Lewis, who was staring at him. And, yeah, you're a problem too, buddy. Maybe he'd stay at the ranch a little while longer. Try to tough it out. Maybe Seth could watch the horses on the weekends, and Chase could go camp somewhere when the ranch swelled with hundreds of loud people. 
It would be a big ask, but Seth was good like that. Yeah, maybe this could work. He would stay for the rest of the summer, and then he would have all winter to come up with a plan. He patted Lewis on the head, feeling much better now that he had some semblance of a plan. He grinned, thinking of Holden. He hadn't asked for many details, and he hadn't given much advice, but he really had helped. He had a knack for that. Maybe he could retire from wrangling and be a shrink for people who didn't talk. Chase nearly laughed aloud at the thought. Chapter 34 It had been two weeks since Seth had seen Lacey. Over and over he tried to convince himself that this was a good thing. He wanted to talk about it with someone, but news had broken about Dustin's impending move, so everyone was focused on that. In an attempt to force himself to move on, he downloaded a dating app, but then he got stuck creating his own profile. What was there to say? He was a grunt worker who barely made above minimum wage. He had no education beyond high school. He had no talents. Sure, he was a nice guy, but that's literally all he had going for him, and he knew that wasn't enough. What was he supposed to do, write a whole paragraph about how nice he was? He didn't even have any hobbies to mention. His hobbies were watching television, helping his family out when they needed it, and fixing random things around the church. Essentially, he realized with a wry grin, being nice was his only hobby. So he never finished his profile, and he never tapped on any woman's photo, and a few days later he deleted the app. Maybe he was destined to be single. And maybe that was okay. Maybe he could be the nice uncle to all the kids that Ava, Olivia, and Evelyn would soon be popping out. He knew it was only a matter of time, especially with Olivia. That woman just oozed maternal instinct. And Ava had been begging Burke for babies for a decade. Now that he'd quit the rodeo, he would probably give in to her pressure. It was late on Friday night, and Seth couldn't sleep, so he looked up Lacey's social media profiles. He felt shame for doing so, but he was tired of scrolling through meaningless videos from strangers. He could check up on Lacey. It didn't have to mean anything. No one had to know. He easily found her profiles, but they told him nothing. She wasn't very good about updating them, and, good for her, her security settings were sky high. But still he lingered on the older profile picture of her. Wow, how he had loved her. Wow, how he still did. Maybe a man couldn't expect to love like that twice in one lifetime. Maybe he'd used up all his good luck on the first go-round. Wait, she had been tagged in someone else's post, someone who didn't have good security settings. Seth clicked on the link. A photo popped up, and he sat bolt upright in bed. He glanced at the date. Two days ago. In Rapid. What was she doing in a dark room in Rapid, with a woman who looked like a zombie? The scary-looking woman had her arm around the back of Lacey's neck and was pulling her in for the photo op. And Lacey looked at least uncomfortable, if not terrified. What on earth was going on? It's not like this lunatic had a Halloween party for an excuse, it was the middle of summer. And not only had this weirdo taken the photo, but then she posted it publicly and tagged Lacey in it. What had Lacey gotten herself into that would lead to a photo like this? Nothing good. Seth wasn't sure what to do. It was the middle of the night. It's not like he could call her and check on her. But should he do that in the morning? The idea made him nervous. He didn't want to bother Lacey, but he couldn't just let this go, could he? A reasonable voice in his head told him that yes, he could absolutely let this go. She was not his girlfriend anymore. She wasn't his responsibility. She was an adult, and he knew full well that she could take care of herself. Even if recent events did not support that assertion, he still knew it for a fact. She'd hit some rough seas lately, but Lacey Flint always kept an even keel. Still, he was worried about her. Maybe he should run into Mrs. Flint tomorrow. Then he could casually ask about how Lacey was doing. Yeah, that was a good idea. Mrs. Flint was always happy to see him. Feeling good about this plan, Seth finally fell asleep and only had one nightmare about the undead. Chapter 35 It took Lacey a few seconds to realize that someone was pounding on her bedroom door. 
The noise blended in with the thrasher music coming from her roommate's bedroom. She sighed and got up off her mattress, which was on the floor, and went to the door. Someone's here to see you, her other roommate shouted over the music. Lacey scanned the shared living space and didn't see anyone. He's outside, she shouted. Didn't want to let him in in case he was a creeper. She winked. Didn't look like a creeper, though. He looked hot. She mimed fanning herself, and Lacey pushed past her to investigate. Had DoorDash gotten a delivery wrong? Lacey did not have hot men showing up to visit her. Her breath caught when she saw him standing there, his hands in his blue jean pockets. Definitely not DoorDash. He was looking down at his boots, so all she could see was the top of his hat. And still, she knew it was him. Seth, what are you doing? He looked up, and she stopped talking. She didn't want to make it sound like she wasn't happy to see him. Sorry, it's great to see you. It felt like it had been a lot longer than it had been, and was it possible that he'd gotten even better looking in the last two weeks? Time was such a funny thing. You just surprised me is all. Seth looked up at the balcony on the neighbor's house. The couple sitting on it made no attempt to hide the fact that they were watching the encounter below like a television show. Lacey stepped back. Come on inside. Seth followed her up the steps and into the apartment, and then he let out a high-pitched yelp. He jumped away from the tanks along one wall, attempting to press himself into the safety of the adjacent wall, crashed into the tanks there, yelped again, and jumped into the middle of the room. He looked at Lacey with wild eyes. Why is your living room full of snakes, he screamed. Abruptly the music shut off, and Catherine opened her door. Did someone scream? She was more intrigued than concerned. Catherine was obsessed with all things horror. Movies, music, and sometimes real life. Today she was dressed like a vampire, complete with fangs. No, no, Lacey said quickly. She wasn't sure how well Catherine and Seth would get along, and she didn't want to risk conflict. The snakes just startled him as all. Oh. She vanished back into the darkness and shut her door, obviously disappointed. Sorry, I should have warned you. She'd gotten rather used to a house full of snakes. Why is your living room full of snake tanks? The music started up halfway through his sentence, and though she'd been able to read his lips, he repeated himself with even more volume. Why is your living room full of snakes? His eyes were giant white orbs. Not wanting to shout, she waved him into her room, though it wasn't much quieter in there. She moved some clothes off her only chair and invited him to sit before plopping down on her mattress. He sat, still looking bewildered. You are moving better. Oh. Yeah, I've been doing my yoga. It's like it never even happened. She smiled, trying not to feel uneasy. It didn't make sense to be uncomfortable. This was Seth. Good old Seth. So why are there snakes? And why are you living here? And why is there a zom? I mean, a vampire? And what? Her laughter interrupted his string of questions. My roommate has pet snakes, and my other roommate is well, a bit, she didn't want to make it sound worse than it was. She liked Catherine. She's sort of obsessed with death. Seth leaned forward and rested his elbows on his knees. Lacey, you need to get out of here. She felt the smile slide off her face. No, she didn't have to get anywhere. She was doing just fine. And he had no business telling her what to do. Why are you here, Seth? Your mother sent me. Lacey rolled her eyes. Are you serious? He nodded. She was furious with her mother. Enough was enough. I'm sorry that she did that, but whatever she told you, it's not true. I love my new job, I like living in Rapid, and I like being able to pay my own bills. He nodded as if he understood all that. But she said you were scared of your roommates. Lacey shook her head. Categorically untrue, and please don't let them catch wind of that. He stared at her. She waited for him to say something, and when he didn't, she felt pressured to fill the void. Hey, you want to hear something crazy? Crazier than a vampire and a snake collection? 
She nodded. Stevie and Kelly are engaged. It took him a second to catch up, but then his eyes widened. Are you serious? I am. And he swears that she is the sweetest thing, like super polite and well-mannered. She works in an art gallery for crying out loud. To hear them talk, it's like he has no idea that she can also be a crazy life of the party. Does she have multiple personalities? I think that only happens on TV. The conversation lulled again despite her efforts. Anyway, I'm happy for them. Turns out it wasn't very smart for me to crash a wedding at your ranch, but it sure worked out well for Stevie. Something mysterious flickered across his face. It's not my ranch. She waved away the correction. I know how you Honeywoods are. What's yours is mine and all that. He shook his head slowly. That's not how it works. Okay, she said slowly. Why was he so stuck on that point? Fine, she wouldn't call it his ranch. Want to hear something else crazy? He nodded, looking relieved. It turns out that Tony is broke. What? She nodded eagerly. Yeah, this lawyer called me and told me that if I wanted to, I could sue because our prenuptial agreement actually wouldn't stand up in court because he lied about his assets. She shrugged. I don't really understand it all, but apparently he's in so much debt that his assets are virtually worthless. Like he looks rich, but if you balance everything out, he's in the hole. Sounds to me like you understand. Well, I don't understand the financial lingo, but, yeah, I think I have the gist of it. Seth was staring at her again, his eyes wide. So you're going to do it? Oh no, she said quickly. Not in a million years. Why? She took a deep breath. How could she explain this without talking for an hour? I don't want to sound self-righteous or anything, but it just felt like dirty money. It's hard to explain, but I know that if I had to spend five minutes getting that money out of him, then it wouldn't be worth it, and you know it would probably take a lot longer than five minutes. I don't want to be around him. I want to forget that part of my life. She stopped to let him catch up and then tagged on, well maybe not forget entirely. I did learn from it. What did you learn, he asked slowly. I learned that money doesn't buy happiness. Duh. She said it playfully, but he didn't laugh. He didn't even smile. I mean I guess I kind of knew that already, but I still thought that I needed the security of a flush bank account in order to relax and enjoy life. She shrugged. And now I am poor as a crow and happier than I've been since, well, she didn't want to finish that sentence, not in front of him anyway. He looked confused. What is it? He shook his head. Nothing. It's not nothing. That's a hilarious story, and you did, in fact, smile. I just don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand how prenuptial agreements work at all. I never did. I just signed it because he told me to. It never occurred to me that he was going to file for divorce a few years later. Seth was shaking his head. No, not that. I guess I just didn't realize that you had this epiphany about wealth and money. Well, I don't want to make it sound like I hate money. I wouldn't turn down a high-paying job or anything. I just won't ever again trade my peace of mind for financial gain. Does that make sense? He still looked confused. So you would have had peace of mind with me? What? What did that have to do with anything? You came to the ranch because you thought that I had money, right? But you just said that you valued your peace of mind, so you thought you would have peace of mind with me. You thought you could have both. Peace of mind and financial security. He wasn't making any sense, and she couldn't even tell how he felt about what he was saying. He was delivering this nonsense with no emotion in his voice. It was very unlike him. I'm not sure I understand, but I didn't go to the ranch because I thought you had money. I mean, why would I think that? His cheeks got a little pink. I don't remember. Something you said a while back made me think that you thought that I had money. She tipped her head to the side and waited for him to remember. He snapped his fingers. It was after your x-rays. 
You said that I owned a fancy wedding venue, that I had money to burn. She tried not to laugh. What? Seth, I was high as a kite. I was babbling. In my sober brain, I never would have thought that renting out an old barn would make someone rich. No offense, but you are a water operator in West Hope, South Dakota. It never occurred to me that you were rich. Unless, of course, you got some big inheritance from some long-lost aunt, but my mom would have made sure I heard about that. She waited for his expression to change, but it didn't. Or you won the lottery. But do you even play the lottery? After a weird long pause, he said, can't really afford to. So then why did you come to the ranch? Hadn't she answered this question at least 50 times already? Do you like hearing me say that I wanted to see you? Do you like rejecting me? Is that some sort of thrill that you missed in the last few weeks? His face fell. Oh no. He said dramatically. What? I've made a terrible mistake. You've made a few recent ones that I know of. Which one did you just become aware of? Chapter 36 Seth felt ill. What had he done? What a fool he'd been. Lacey, I'm so sorry. I'm an idiot. Hudson was worried that you were going to sue us, and I was worried that you were trying to marry me for my money that I didn't have. You did not deserve to be treated like that by any of us. Actually, I sort of did. I mean, I made a terrible choice three years ago. It makes sense that people would have trouble trusting me. But it was only one mistake. I wish that you could trust me again. I wish that you would give me a second chance. He wanted to take her into his arms and hold her for the rest of his life. But he had been such a jerk. Did she even want him anymore? Was there still a chance? Would you like to go for a drive? He needed to get away from this music. It was making it hard to think. I could buy you a cup of coffee. I don't think any coffee houses are open this late. At least I can't think of any. Then I'll take you through the McDonald's drive through He flinched. Sorry if that was insulting. I didn't think before I said it. Seth, what is wrong with you? I'm still me. I will be perfectly happy to go to the McDonald's drive through but I want a shake instead of a coffee. He chuckled. Deal. He popped up out of his chair and opened the door for her, and the music got louder. He walked her to the truck and then hurried to open the door for her. Lacey, I can't even believe what a dunce I've been. She giggled. It's okay. It's not like I've been on my best behavior. He hung his head. You haven't done anything wrong. Oh really? Do all the girls trying to win your heart show up in your manure pile? You wouldn't have had to do that if I had just returned your calls. Okay, that's true. Fine, you've been a dunce. But you can make it up to me. He helped her into the truck and then hurried to get behind the wheel. There's even more. He braced himself for her disappointment. Well, best to spill it now, get it all out in the open. Your mom did tell me to come here tonight but only because I made myself bump into her in town. You made yourself? Yeah, I followed her and then went into the drugstore when she did. I don't think she knew I was being that creepy, though. But then when I asked about you, she said you were in danger, and even though I knew she was exaggerating, I used it as an excuse to come see you. I'm not sure why I didn't have the guts to just tell you that I wanted to see you. I'm sorry. He felt so small. He hated this feeling. Lacey had always made him feel larger than life. He wanted to get back to that. So you orchestrated bumping into her because you wanted to see me? Yeah, that's so sweet. Sweet wasn't the word he would use. Creepy was a better fit. Insane might even work. I'm glad you think so. She didn't say anything, so he said, tell me about your new job. She told him, and he paid close attention. Though the job didn't sound very exciting, she got excited talking about it, and that excitement was contagious. He asked leading questions, and he enjoyed the sound of her voice. It was almost like the old days. She was just lacy again. 
he got her a chocolate milkshake, and he got himself a coffee, grateful for the caffeine. He still had to drive back to West Hope tonight, but they sat in his truck for hours, catching up and telling old stories they'd already heard. She told him long ago, probably more than once, about the time she had taken a tumble into her ice cream cake when she was two, but she now insisted that this was a new story, and he laughed at it like he was hearing it for the first time. Seth, it's two o'clock in the morning. He laughed. I know. I'm surprised the McDonald's police haven't come to chase us off. Now that would be a story to tell our. He knew what she had been about to say, and it pleased him mightily. Once again, he could finish her sentences, but he didn't this time. At least not aloud. He also knew why she hadn't finished the sentence, and he agreed with her. This was happening, and he couldn't be happier. But it was good to take things slow, to relish every moment. They didn't need to make up for lost time. They had plenty of time stretched out in front of them. Do you have to work tomorrow? She nodded. Bright and early. Then I'm sorry for keeping you out so late. He started the truck. Let me get you home. He shuddered. Unless of course you'd like me to find you a hotel room. I'm sorry, but those snakes really bother me. She giggled. They don't bother me at all, though, so you can just take me home. I pay a third of the rent. I might as well sleep there, even if it's only for a few hours this time. Do the snakes pay rent? She giggled. They do not. Shouldn't their owner pay more rent since she's taking up so much room? Seth, it's really okay. I don't mind the snakes, and I don't mind paying my fair share of the rent. But what if one of them escapes its tank and slithers into your room? He instantly felt guilty for planting this fear into her head. None of them are poisonous. What? he cried. There is no way that snakes that big aren't poisonous. She laughed, blatantly mocking his fear. I'm not sure there's a direct correlation between size and fatality, but I assure you, none of them are poisonous. Anyway, none of them can fit under my door, and I keep it shut, so you don't have to worry about me. Seth looked away from the road to steal a glance at her face. It looked magical in the yellow light cast by the street lamps. How long do you think it will be before I can stop feeling the need to apologize? How long do you think it will be before I can stop feeling the need to apologize, she said right back. I forgive you, Lacey. All you did was choose not to marry me. Yeah, that broke my heart, but I was wrong to hold such a grudge for so long. Do you mean it? She was going to make him say it again, and he couldn't blame her. Yeah, I mean it. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. No, I need the part about forgiving me. Do you really forgive me? Yes, I really do. I'm so sorry it took me so long. She slid across the bench and kissed him on the cheek. And I'm really sorry it took me so long to find my way back to you, but I'm here now, for good this time if you'll have me. He yanked the truck over to the side of the road, slammed it into park before the wheels had stopped moving, and then kissed her like he had been waiting to do it his whole life, and she kissed him back, and it didn't feel like the old days. It felt even better. He was finally living in the moment. They had changed, but they'd both changed for the better, and now they were together again. For good, this time. Epilogue Seth placed both hands on the top of her desk and then stuck his cowboy hat-clad head between her eyes and the computer screen. Then he kissed her so passionately that she let out a little yelp before pulling away. Seth We're at work. I know that, Lace. But I can't help myself. Every time I come in the office now, you're sitting here like a beautiful queen. Huh. She pushed her wheelchair back from the desk as she was also struggling not to jump on him. He was like a magnet, and the fact that they were at work and weren't supposed to be chasing each other around the office made the magnetism even stronger. Or maybe it was her hormones. Lots of things were making his magnetism stronger. How had she ever managed to stay away from him at all? I must have forgotten to wear my crown today. He grinned like a crazy man. Oh, sugar, you're wearing it every day, even if I'm the only one who sees it. He came for her again, and she rolled back another two feet. 
She was glad her chair had wheels, but soon she was going to hit a wall. She tipped her head and studied him. Are you sure you're going to be okay, with me working here? She'd lost track of how many times she'd asked this question. Most of the times had been before she'd started working there, but she'd also checked in several times since. Of course I'm sure. Apparently he hadn't tired of the question. He straightened to a stand and put on his more serious, more professional smile. I mean, if you're asking if I'm okay, that you make more money than I do now, then yes, I am man enough to handle that. She shook her head. That's not what I was asking, and you know it, though I guess I could ask them for a pay cut. She giggled at the thought. She was pretty sure no one had asked them that before. He bent over again, put a hand on her small stomach, and kissed her lightly on the forehead. No, we had better not do that. We are going to need every penny. I've got this feeling you're carrying twins. She pushed his hand away, and even though he'd only whispered, she shushed him. Someone will hear us. They were going to tell people soon, but for now they were enjoying having their very tiny secret. And they wanted to tell her mother and Seth's brothers before they told anyone else. Lacey was excited to tell people, especially Ava, who would be ecstatic that the baby in her belly was going to have a cousin the same age, but she was also enjoying having a little secret with her husband. But maybe you should ask for a raise then. He winked at her. Just waiting for the right time. And besides, I just asked them to give my wife a job, remember? Need to space out my favors. He sighed. Okay, if I'm going to earn a pay raise, then I need to get back to work. The good people of South Dakota need their clean water. He said this as if she were the one who had told him to stop working. He glanced up at the vent over her head. Enjoy your air conditioning. She narrowed her eyes at him. Enjoy your sweltering heat. He laughed and turned for the door. But she just couldn't let him go. She got up and followed him outside into the hot sunshine, wrapped her arms around his waist, and pressed her cheek into his warm back. I sure do love you, Seth Honeywood. He slowly turned around and returned her embrace. I sure do love you back, Lacey Flint Honeywood. She giggled. She loved it when he called her that. She let go of him and watched him go to his truck. Then she watched him drive away, marveling at the fact that she now loved everything about her life. Even the crazy brothers. Even the unpaid bills. Even the morning sickness. She was loving every moment in this small town, with this simple life, with this kind, gorgeous man. She'd made some missteps along the way, but she sure had ended up in a field of roses, and she relished every second of their sweet scent. She put her hand on her belly, even though there was no bump there yet, and turned to go back into her air conditioning. It greeted them with a refreshing whoosh. You're welcome, she said to her womb. I don't know if you can feel it, but it is very hot outside. Of course she knew the baby couldn't feel things like that, but it was fun to imagine that he or she could and there had better not be two of you in there.